Okay, let's get going. Uh, welcome to the planning board meeting for November 2nd, 2015. Uh, this is a shout out to uh, John and our other two members that are missing. And hopefully they'll be viewing the tape uh, very shortly. Uh, John is recovering well and uh, hopes to rejoin us at our next meeting. Uh, the agenda tonight are 745 uh, with the 3440 Hayden Row has requested a continuance, so they won't be there. So we'll probably continue the legacy stuff till about 8. Then we'll get uh, some of the other business of the board done. And then at 9 o'clock we have uh, the tennis club on Lumber Street and a scenic road public hearing for Eversource. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that uh, November 9th, there's a big vote for uh, two debt exclusions. Uh, you can vote all day at the uh, middle school gym, as usual. So uh, anyway, with that, uh, let's continue the discussion on Rafferty Road with Legacy Farms. Roy and Paul group. Evening, folks. Good evening. Well, I think we're almost there, and uh, but there's a couple items we need to kind of, uh, I think, rash up, uh, go over. Sure. I think the key one that we ought to talk about first is the width of the road, because that seems to be a lingering issue at this point. And uh, I. Members, I think you've got a memo from Beta, and let's see. Oh, we have a Beta representative. I can't see you there. Move, oh, move just a couple more. <laughs> yeah. You can join us, Andy, if you want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So basically, uh, the question really got there, and I quite frankly didn't realize that's what we were looking at last time. I probably would have got that resolved the last time around as whether it should be 22 or 24 feet. And Mr. Jim, I can make yeah. a few comments sure. on that. Um, so we actually went out there today and actually physically measured the width of the entire road, you know, at every 100 feet just to see where the current road is. And as, as you are all aware, it's kind of threading the needle a little bit in doing this project because You've got a drainage swale on the south side of the street, approximately, it varies but anywhere from one to two and a half feet off the road. You've got a drainage swale on the north side of the road, which is the side where the sidewalk is going to go. You've got utility poles down that whole length of the road, which are approximately varying two to two and a half feet off the road. And so when we <coughs> looked at this preliminarily with VHP to figure out how to design this and maintain a width of road that right now is it varies right now anywhere from 21 to 21 and a half feet and the design that VHB came up with was 22 foot road now I know someone mentioned 24 feet in Ashto now my understanding of Ashto is you can actually have a, a gravel edge a flat smooth gravel edge which in <coughs> fact I think you'd find that with a gravel edge we have close to 24 feet uh, in the finished road and the sidewalk itself <coughs> The, re the, the, the 117 trees that are proposed to be taken down are over a distance of about a half a mile. It sounds like a lot of trees, but when one looks at these, I think you all received a copy of the aerial photograph, it's uh, actually, frankly, a minuscule amount of trees relative to the area that it's in. And again, it's 117 trees, some of a three or four inch caliber. There are a few that are quite large, the 36 or more inch caliber, but it is over a distance of a half a mile. So getting to the width of the road, you know, we felt in designing with, and I'll let uh, Wayne speak in a moment about, you know, the, the width. We felt that the 22 feet um, is a, a width, especially if we put a line down the middle of the street, and with the gravel shoulders, it minimizes the amount of trees that need to be cut down. It minimizes the amount of wetlands, and frankly, it keeps us off of the Eversource property which would become a whole issue unto itself. And do you want to add anything to that? No, I think, you know, to Roy's point, I mean, 11 <coughs> foot lanes are more than acceptable on a, a residential road like this, rural residential road like this. Um, the intent of the project, again, was to add this walking path, minimize the, 
the, the removal of the trees uh, to the most practical, uh, most extent practicable, and to stay out of the wetlands as much as we could. We had a few wetland impacts, this, you know, here and there, as we demonstrated last time. We could run through that again if needed, but that was really the intent. So if, if the road was to be widened another two feet, you'd be talking a lot more trees, a lot more wetland impacts, etc. Um, and uh, again, from standard engineering practice. Uh, highway lanes are 12 feet wide, to put that in perspective. You know, 11-foot lanes on a residential street are actually very generous, in my opinion. I'm a roadway guy, so I think that uh, they're very generous. It, I'm not going to dispute what Beta says about, you know, quoting Ashto, that he's correct. But 12-foot um, lanes, again, that's what you see on a highway. Um, and uh, I don't think it's necessary in this situation. Why don't you give your response here? <laughs> our, our general, I mean, I don't disagree with Wayne's approach that, that 22 feet is, is reasonable for a residential road. Uh, where I think we come down on is that this road will likely see more traffic than your average residential road. And when you start to approach you know, 2,000 vehicles per day, we'd like to see a little, you know, a one-foot shoulder type of a, a shy distance is uh, a more appropriate design. I also agree with the other gentleman that, you know, a recoverable shoulder, a gravel side, a soft shoulder is not an unreasonable approach, but our, our standpoint, our recommendation would be with the amount of track it sees would be to go to 24 foot width. Other question? Claire, go ahead. I, I'd be interested to see what the traffic engineers say about this, but um, it seems that the wider the roads or the better the surface, the faster the cars go. Um, I, I remember years ago, Spring Street took you five minutes to get all the way down the end of Spring Street, and then they pa repaved it, and you were down there in a minute. The cars just stepped on it. Um, I am looking at the conditions that were in the master plan special permit in condition 62, which if you were doing the senior housing, which I assume right now you're working towards, that agreement only required the 22 <coughs> feet, and the 24 was only if you would go up to the 200 commercial. I think that's if we changed the master plan special permit. As it is right now, we would have to. So what, what, how it's written today, Claire, it's 24 feet. Actually, uh, <coughs> my recollection of the language in the master plan special permit is it needs to be 24 feet unless the planning board decides otherwise. Well, then I'm reading, what I'm reading is May 10th, 2010. This is what was signed by the planning board then. So I guess you're saying there's, no. there's been a minute to no, that, that, that's it. No, she, no, what it's got is Roy's proposed changes in it. Claire. Oh, these are the changes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just questioning whether one foot on either side is going to just increase the speed because there are some issues going around now about the amount of tree cutting and the amount of widening and you're putting <coughs> a path in as well. So if you do the if you do the one foot shoulder on each side and then you do the path on top of it, you're you're opening it up and widening it even further. And I do believe there are some residents that are concerned about the look and the character of the feel of the road and doing everything we can to to maintain that. Um, and traffic calming often has to do with designing the road in such a way that it forces people to slow down a little. So that's just my comment on making it wider makes it faster, I think. I went out last week, Wednesday, Wednesday <laughs> with, with Chris to, to go up and down it. Before I met him, I drove the width or the length of the road, and I almost clipped a mirror partly because there was a lot of leaves on each of the shoulders. Maybe if there's a few more cars on it, they'll get blown off. And it was obviously a little bit. And I wasn't paying attention to the center line. After that, I <laughs> kind of called up Roy and said, maybe if you're going with 22 feet, you need to put a center line on the road so that old folks like me can make sure that we stay on the right side. Uh, <coughs> then we're out there. And one point, Chris and I are on one side of the street. And I was wearing a red vest. so. We were pretty visible. There was a dog walker on the other side, and two cars started to pass, and they both came to a stop. And we weren't all at the same spot at the same time, but we were within where people got cautionary. So, you know, bottom line is with the sidewalk, I don't think the obstacles would have been on the shoulder at all. Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, beginning to your point, Ken, I, I do think there should be a line painted down the middle of that street. I think it would make it much safer and more visual and 
I think actually it would help slow people down a little mm -hmm. bit because right now you're right. I mean, I find myself doing the same thing. You drive down it, you're not really paying as much attention to which side of the street you should be on because there's nothing to <coughs> define it. Yeah. And part of it, uh, I'm looking at trees, you know, I'm trying to do other things while I'm <laughs> driving along. But there's no, um, I, I don't see in the proposed plan any other um, controlling factor aside from uh, speed limit signs to limit the speed of the vehicles on the road to the level that the road is being designed for, which is 35 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. right? there's, there's no other limiting factor to control the speed. There's no speed bumps, there's nothing else that designed within this, this proposed design to keep people at that limit. We, we might need to put some some speed limit signs. That's probably a pretty good idea. Uh, I think it's a very good idea. Mm -hmm. You know, because cause this is going to be, this is designed to be a cut through with minimal curb cut type road. I mean, that's, yeah. and, <coughs> and a lot of our <coughs> streets like Hayden Row, East Main Street, I believe have 40 mile an hour limits. So. There will be a tendency to go faster than 35. People do greater than 35 on Wilson, and everybody knows it's that, that's a narrower, windier road, mm -hmm. a lot more impediments. So on this straightaway, people I know people do 50 down there. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be some other restraint design, regardless of the width of the road that you increase it to. Mm -hmm. Need some restraint other than the speed of its signs. Well, it might be a revenue source for the Hopkinton's <laughs> finest. <laughs> um, and also, if you stripe a center line, don't you usually put a side stripe as well with a little extra? Like it's, it depends it's on the character of the road and so forth. It's not necessary all the time. So on a, on a, yeah, on a larger road, yes, you'd have, a, you'd have an edge. On a rural residential road like this, you don't see it that often, mm. honestly. I, well, it's not really a residential road. Uh, rural road. Yeah. I mean, I, my thinking was if you did the side stripe as well, again, it visually narrows the road. It's not physically narrowing it, but it visually narrows it. And all the traffic studies show whatever you do, visual cues cause drivers to slow down on their own. So you're talking about a fog line. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, so it doesn't make the road any narrower, but visually, yeah. it, it, didn't, it defines it in a narrower way, and it'll cue the driver a little bit, I would think. Yep. Don't, don't well, disagree with that. One of the reasons that I think we're trying to get the traffic to go on Rafferty is because we're trying to avoid, I'll say, Wilson Street traffic, mm -hmm. and we're trying to encourage that way as right. opposed to people turning off and going yep. anywhere Correct. else. Great. How are you? So where are the planning board members on the width? 22 feet with a stripe sounds okay? That's I, adequate. I, I, can I ask a question on the numbers? Yeah. So the, the volume of traffic has you thinking that 24 makes more sense. At what traffic volume would we, would a 22 foot wide road make sense to you? I think we had stated the general cutoff would be about 2,000 vehicles per day. I don't recall off the top of my head what your traffic numbers were. No, I need to do that. So <laughs> you could certainly check that. Out. But again, I think if you have those gravel shoulders, you're going to you're going to achieve the equivalent of that. I think we had it in our letter. I think somewhere we had the number. It's in the application, I believe. Wasn't there somewhere traffic? I'm just wondering if we just tip that number or that constraint. Or, or for significant Yeah, I don't, I don't think it was significantly like double the projection for 750 new daily trips. If it goes to uh, age restricted zone, that's what I'm looking at from Exhibit C from the uh, revisions. Not all of these, right? Are they the point? That, that, that's for full site. Some of them will head out the other way, some will head down the property. Yeah, I'm just reading off here. You right. know, I was just saying they're looking for numbers. That's what it says yeah. right here. But that that really doesn't the original projection is something like three thousand daily trips. This is the current project. Okay. And we really we, what we really don't have is the and in this table we don't have what Legacy North and, and the uh, Ashland uh, cut through traffic uh, add to the to the thing. So I guess we don't have the numbers tonight. 
Chairman? Yep. I, I have one more concern about the gravel shoulder. In, in addition to what I also said about it, already said about it visually widening the road. Um, I know there's a current problem right now with Bay Path and people parking on that road, and they're probably going to have to deal with that one way or another, and I don't know where that shelter is going to be when this is all done. But I would wonder <coughs> if they're still there, and you build that one-foot gravel edge, is that going to be an encouragement for people to continue to try to park? Because they feel like they can pull off a little bit into that gravel edge. It just I, feeds I, into that. If, if I can comment, Mr. Go Chairman, I, I think when this road is completed and the sidewalk is in, there has to be a, a prohibition on parking in that street. There and, is already. I think this, yeah, well, but it's not, no but it's not enforced. Right. I mean, you can buy oh, eight, nine cars out there. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's a hazard because it's one thing to have the dog walkers, but if you have the dog walkers and the cars parked, yeah. I, I just think it's problematic. I've spoken to them about, I even told my designer for them, is build a parking lot on their site, yeah. you know, just a gravel parking lot so there's no impervious <coughs> problems, mm -hmm. and park all the cars on the site. I mean, for, you know, not a lot of money, you could build a parking lot there so no one parks on the street. And their response? I think they're uh, intrigued by the idea, but until we finish this process, mm -hmm. I didn't want to pursue it. Okay. But I think we have to pursue it. Yeah, I just don't want to add more encouragement right. to the cars. Okay, so I, I am sensing a consensus of 22 feet with a center stripe at this point. I just have one question. Okay, go ahead. Five or so years ago when this was created, what was the reasoning for a 24 foot wide road? Not just uh, Legacy North, which is a 24 foot wide layout. Okay. And we were considering 200,000 square feet of commercial, which has significantly more traffic. Okay. And, and a lot of that traffic would be right in that corner, so, right. so most of it would probably, I think, go out more that way. The commercial ones, or the residential might go <coughs> either way. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we've kind of got that done. Can, and, can I yeah. just ask what yeah. you said center straight? Any more thoughts about the side straight? Well, that's a good question. That we'll it we'll 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 visually it. narrows it. I, I would agree with Claire with the side stripe. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so. We could certainly add that. You know, it so it, it gets kind of uh, it gets kind of interesting when you add an edge line because normally you like to put it about a foot off the shoulder at mm -hmm. a minimum. Mm -hmm. So you could probably do, given the character of this road, you could probably go six inches off. Yeah. So now now that theoretically that kind of narrows the lane to like ten and a half feet instead of eleven yeah. feet. Yeah. Um, I don't disagree with your approach, though. It sometimes it does channelize things a little bit more, and it may slow people down. I personally, I don't have any issue with that. If the, that's I, what the board I, wanted I, to I do. Agree with that. Yeah. Recommendation from Beta. I, I concur. I'll be all right. I mean, typically you would have an eleven foot lane, but ten and a half on a residential. Kind of okay. Rural character. We're, we're, we're trying to keep <laughs> this keep this slow. Well, we've got you know you've got a sidewalk. You've got obviously known um, a known parking problem. You've got a lot of walkers and so forth, and I think that edge line would really clarify where the edge of the road is and keep people going slower. So I think that's a good, a good alternative. Okay, Actually, so you bring a very good point. Where there's a berm, and having a white line in front of the berm will help delineate the berm itself. It's very true. Yeah. And 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 we we are adding, you know, the first line we're going to probably expect from Legacy, but every year from there on, it will be a town expense. So we'll maintain it. <coughs> okay, so we've, we've come up with the street width and, and, and length. The other thing in rereading the package for this, um, the turn lane gets shorter on Cedar Street. And let's talk about, let's have the engineers talk about that for a second. Um, so this is um, this is specifically on at the Cedar intersection, yeah. um, and it, it can if I if I could, Mr. Chairman, um, it's being shortened versus what was originally discussed. I think is that is that mm -hmm. that's okay. the question. Um, I'm a little unprepared for that. I apologize. Well, the re the re the re I guess a couple things. One is in um, Rich Holworth, who did the original design, who's been working on this throughout and in conjunction with uh, their traffic analysis people 
again, this was seven years ago, so they're looking at it in today's world, and have come to the conclusion based on uh, the traffic counts on the project itself, based on the traffic counts for the, the 180 units age restricted component and the turn lanes that they feel are required for the project, they feel this is the appropriate design for it currently. So this is on painted on the cedar this sheet, is yeah, on, on the Ross cedar sheet paper, not one, on the rack. One sheet back of right. grass. Yes. So, so basically, you, you, how many cars you can start store going left before you get back to the truck? We're running it from the 300 to the 240. Mm -hmm. So that's 60 feet, so... Three cars. Three cars. Yeah, I don't even... Um, when we looked at this design, I don't even think the queue length was more than 100 100, 150 feet max um, from memory. Maybe the original analysis showed something hmm. showed something uh, higher with the commercial use. Why don't we think about approving what's been designed with a condition that if the village center gets built, we look at the queue length? You don't mean the village center. You mean the commercial component? No, the village center, because I think that's going to draw more people. You know, if you get a shopping center down in the western nursery, oh, I see what you're saying. So you want to revisit it if the village center is built? Yeah. That's fine. Because, I mean... As of right now, though, as... I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. go ahead. It is the bypass road idea where we're alleviating some traffic downtown and um, 60 feet of backup. What would that look like on, on the grid that we have up now, on the, on the graph that's that? I don't understand the question. Uh, if there's 60 feet, if there's three cars backed up, how deep would that be? Would that be to the kennel, or would it be? No, no, no. It's, it's, no, not, it's, it's not Cedar. It's Cedar Street. It's Cedar Street. Actually, on to show them the lane, lane, if you would, please. The oh. Ross, do you remember what we what no, the queue? That's right there. Queue was designed for. Yeah, it keeps going beyond that. Like this. Yeah, that left turn. It's designed so, for uh, so if you queue plus the full. If you're coming from Southboro, which is in this direction, you'd be coming this way here. You're returning up to wrap. Is that 180 feet? So this is the lane here. Yeah. Now, to the chairman's point, saying this should be revisited if, in fact, the village center gets built, if, in fact, it's required, I, I don't have an issue with that. So I, sometimes I do take that turn like that, and there is, uh, you have to wait for the people coming down to 85. But you'd have to do that no matter what. Right. And so if it, if it gets worse, there's something, if there's more traffic. If we revisit it because there's more reasons for traffic. Well, there's going to be more people wanting to turn left there. Significantly more people turn left. I think that's a good solution. That makes sense. You okay? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we're all set with the length on there. Are they, are they going to actually widen the road to the south side of Rafferty on Cedar? to make that right turn on Rafferty. Why don't one of you guys turn. explain exactly yes, what's going on with that intersection so okay. everyone understands. Okay. Okay. The widening is actually going to be on the east side. So here's, here's Rafferty here. Yeah. There'll be no widening at all on the west side. Correct. Yeah. The widening will actually be on the east side. Yeah. So if you're coming out Rafferty and you take a right, yeah. that's where the widening will happen. There's actually a utility pole there. Now, yeah. if you've gone by, you probably saw a yeah. ribbon on it. The pole needs to move back four feet. Okay. The guardrail will come out. The slope will get be extended. Yeah. The riprap will be extended. This corner here will be widened on Rafferty, and this shoulder here will be extended also. Okay. So there'll be there'll be no touching of the west side, but only on the east side. Gotcha. Okay. So you're going to make that turn a lot a, a lot, lot smoother. A lot smoother. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay, does anyone else have any questions on on this intersection? Okay, so yeah, I just have one question. It's Go ahead. Just in the in the diagram, the, that little island um, looks like for the right turn coming off of Rafferty onto Cedar. Yep. Mm -hmm. What is that island? I couldn't figure out what it, that it's was. It's just a delineator. Is so it painted? Someone, is it? I think it is only yeah. paint, but yeah. Just okay. paint. So That's someone wants to, to yeah. know. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, okay, so I think we've got the road width and, and intersection kind of straightened out. Any questions anyone else has on those two items? No? Okay, so we're all set.
the, on that, then we're into the sidewalk. And the sidewalk is a five-foot meandering sidewalk, and I'm trying to remember what other issues in the beta letter did have are not brought up. We I think we got, got everything resolved. <coughs> so I think the stormwater is the only, you know, oh, lingering sorry. issue in regards to that. And I think we left that since then. The, the town is going to clean out the one line that needs to be done, and you guys are going to make sure the water gets into the other one. Right. Correct. So, Mr. Chairman, if I could. So, since, since our last hearing, uh, we've coordinated with Beta. Beta has talked to DPW, CONCOM. I've spoken with both DPW and CONCOM. Uh, basically, in essence, what we've agreed to do, what the applicant has agreed to do, is basically install about 400 feet of stone lined um, swale on the southerly side of Rafferty. Um, thanks, Ross. The southerly side of Rafferty uh, from Cedar up uh, in that, basically, in that drainage ditch. I confirmed with CONCOM that they were comfortable with that, that they, even though that technically is classified as a wetland, that it was acting more like a drainage ditch. So they confirmed that they were okay with that. Um, additionally, on the um, north side of Rafferty, uh, we had a we have a separation. Uh, previously, had a separation with the grass strip anywhere from two and a half feet to four feet, uh, depending on where we were going uh, with the with the walking path, whether it was going around the wetlands or utility pole, etc. Uh, at Beta's suggestion, uh, and it's, it was a good one. They were concerned that that really wasn't uh, getting a lot of infiltration credit. So what we did is we changed that grass to basically a, a three inch minus stone. Uh, stone um, lined uh, area, if you will, just ba it's basically three inches of uh, stone for that two and a half feet or four feet. And I confirmed with DPW today that they were fine with that, and they thought that that was a, a good solution to try to uh, slow down the velocity. We not only understand how steep this road is and so forth. Um, so similar to what's happening on the south side uh, with the scour and erosion and so forth, and the fact that that um, the stone will uh, mitigate that on the south side. We're doing the same thing on the north side, and DPW thought that that was a good solution as well. Um, and I think you guys had asked uh, for some revised stormwater calculations that I believe Ross sent over um, to you guys, uh, and I apologize, but as late as today. Um, and I, I'm not sure if there was anything else. Um, that from memory, that was those were the only issues. Those were the big thought. issues, yep. yeah. The only other thing, it says beta defers to the EPA, and this issue, this is a stormwater pollution prevention program prior to construction right is that something this board needs to worry about or do we defer to the EPA it's essentially whether it gets permitted as a single project or not. right yeah so right now that the applicant is proposing to construct Rafferty and Cedar as two separate projects most likely at two separate times depending on this again as Roy said there's a utility pole that needs to move on Cedar Street we really can't do anything until that moves and we know that uh, utility companies, when he, he calls them today, they'll be out there tomorrow to move that, right? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> actually, I'm being that facetious. Was, that polar requested moved six months ago. Yeah. So, six most months, likely, yeah, most likely the work on Rafferty will get done first, and Cedar Street will follow up after that. Uh, so, technically, you know, there is a less than an acre of disturbance on each project. So, technically, you don't need a SWIP. Um, you know, it's really not that big a deal. It's something that that uh, Roy's contractor will do. Um, if we need, if if we need to work in conjunction with uh, Concom, if we need to get a script, we will. I don't think we will, but again, that probably is an issue for Concom if we need it. It really is, and it's a construction. You know, it's a programmatic general. Uh, it's a, a programmatic permit that is done through EPA when you disturb more than an acre of of uh, land. And the way it's broken up with the two projects, technically you don't disturb more than an acre. If something happens and they have to do them at the same time, um, they can certainly have their contract to do that. Uh, Go ahead, Claire. Question. Um, I may have just missed this in your comments, sir. I sure. know DBW said they would clean out the clogged culvert, but they mentioned it being 12 to 18 inches too high, and I'm noticing in your letter they asked it either be lowered or else to provide a berm to redirect the flow. Was that the berm you were just so, talking about now? No, I think relative to that, and Ross, please correct me if, I'm, if I forget this here, but I think what in... Um, in lieu of lowering that culvert, what we agreed to do is provide uh, stone um, riprap at each culvert um, side um, on the southern side, the three culvert sides on the southern side, and a series of check dams at those culverts. But I don't think the DPW was planning to lower the culvert, nor were, was the applicant at well, this point. Well, I'm seeing another point was the stone check dams, but I'm looking under Bayer's letter regarding the culvert, and for the culvert, they said provide berms. 
to redirect the flow to this culvert and make it effective in reducing the flow in the swale. So the check dam was another uh, point, I thought. I thought in we this, had in some this case, I'd say the berm and the check dam are pretty much synonymous. It's just a, a check dam is a berm. It's just generally that's a... Uh, Different you know, vernacular. Put, we're going to put one, essentially a berm, just, just downstream of the culvert, so basically water can pool, get the right elevation across the culvert. It's better yeah. comfortable with that? Yeah. If, if you read our culvert, we actually say it a sort of an either or. Either lower the culvert or make <coughs> these modifications to make it work. Okay. And we'll so we'll come forth that. The letter I'm looking at, those are separate items, so I just... Uh, yeah. Think you want a letter behind sure. or not? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe yeah, not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. October 23rd. Okay, as long as Bates... Oh, regardless, we, we'll come through with what they proposed. Okay. <laughs> Staying up with you guys. <laughs> okay, so appreciate that. Okay, that's good. I think the, the, the last issue that's mm -hmm. remaining is a bunch of trees that are coming down as a result of building a sidewalk. Well, I have a, I have a point about the water. Go ahead. Um, it's more of a procedural thing. It's not necessarily about, I think you guys were really on point and on the same page. But, uh, as for me getting on the same page, I, I just got this updated letter with the comments. And, uh, I really do like to talk to, you know, liaison to the com com and been on the com com. And I like to kind of, when you say, oh, I talk to them. Sure. I don't see that in black and white. No, I understand. I don't, I don't hear feedback from them. And I know Ed was just here, and yeah. I think he had comments, and he got called away. So I would like to know what he had to say about this more particularly. Um, so I, I don't feel comfortable without having more information. And then Beta comment about uh, getting DPW to approve the design of uh, SW1 uh, about stormwater is uh, Station 18 to Wilson Street, whatever, at what point do we get DPW to approve a design? If that's what your suggestion. I don't know. Well, if you can answer the question, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we actually got a letter from CONCOM in response to all of Beta's comments saying that they had no issue with any of it. I think you have all received the same letter. Not, not since Have, not since have you received CONCOM approval for this project yet? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I'm not, over a month ago. Okay. And uh, I spoke to Don McAdam this afternoon about all this, and he's fine with everything that we're discussing. I, I don't doubt he is. I, I'm, I think everything looks pretty fine. I just don't yep. see... In well, the process yeah. of where we get well, the actual notification. If, and, if, and if what he's doing order violates their order conditions, they will be the enforcer. That's yeah. what I, you know. <laughs> if they're not happy, they, 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 have a, they have a bigger clout than you and I do. Okay. I think it's eyes are dotted and teeth are crossed. I just would like to see in, in black and white okay. what he's we said. And we that. just got this. I just sat down and looking yeah, at I it. I understand. And uh, I would like a little bit more information. Um, so. If if the letter from DPW is in my in our packet right now, no. is that the same one that, that he's saying? Uh, right. So, so well, I, I, I think, think the, like, so ahead, I think the chairman said it uh, best in that the order of conditions is really going to supersede anything we do, and if anything we deviate from those, it would, it's really in the purview of the CONCOM. And I think uh, my understanding, speaking to Don today, that. Everything's been discussed with all the, the beta correspondence has been accepted by them. I okay. think, um, in fact, they're Phil right next door, aren't they? Yeah. At the meeting tonight? Um, Andy, I think that Phil spoke with, yeah. with CONCOM about this prior to me doing that. I just, I called Don last week just to confirm, actually, to your point. I said, I was, beta told me that they spoke with you, but just, you know, because this is classified as a wetland, I just want to make sure that CONCOM is okay. And Don echoed, he says, nope, Phil did speak with me. We spoke about it at the last hearing. And you know we're comfortable with that. Um, I, I'm not doubting that. Yes, yeah. I don't have anything in black and white. I'm just telling you what I was told. But you should, <laughs> you should all, I'll get together with, with a couple of the guys, sure. for coffee or lunch or something, yep. and then we'll update what's going on. And I just haven't done that. So understood that this just coming in today, and what you're saying, I just don't feel as comfortable. Um, just to clarify with that, I mean, Hong Kong only covers those areas that directly impact the wetlands along the road. It doesn't cover that they, they don't have overseeing powers over the entire stretch of road, only those areas that impact the wetlands and the buffer zones. So it's important to clarify that fact. And, and in regards to SW1 here, 
data recommended on the 23rd that the sidewalk of its door should be redesigned and lowered to allow road runoff to seep by directly across the sidewalk into the existing midland. Which has been done. Which, which, right. which we've done. That's in the current plans. Correct. So the sidewalk now, so the plan has changed and the sidewalk is going to yes. be lowered between those stages. Yes, that's correct. Yes. 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 I mentioned that I believe Concom issued an order of conditions for this part and they deferred to the planning board on the stormwater. Oh, that's okay. right. Yeah. They did. That's right. Okay. Well, I think we've heard from our engineer <coughs> at this point that stormwater is, is acceptable design. Yep. Yeah, as, as of this letter, the, the, the issue is whether the, the DPW would be willing to maintain the, the three-inch stone at the edge of the road. And I, I did speak with John today about that, and he understood yeah. that because he specific, John specifically walked this with Phil mm -hmm. from Beta uh, on the other side, and I told him what we were doing on this side to kind of mimic that, and he goes, no, I have no problem with that. That's probably a good solution. If the, uh, if the grass wasn't going to function properly, the, the replacement of the stone is, uh, is acceptable. Okay. They mentioned to Phil, you know, what if the DPW finds the stone a problem? He said they can just replace it with grass. Yeah. Okay, I think now we're down to some trees, and then we can kind of maybe close this thing out. Can I ask one question? Sure, go ahead. Um, with respect to the surface water that's going to go on, the, on this existing road that's already eroding the south side gully, so that now the bottom of the gully is lower than the pipe intake, that's happened over the past uh, ten, 10 or so years, that's eroded away. Now, we've already got downhill, there's a whole community of 21 houses downhill of Rafferty that are directly impacted by the existing road surface and the surface water runoff. I have neighbours that have backyards that become swimming pools during the spring runoff. So now, we have, according to the engineer from Beta, a 35% increase in, in, in per, impervious material and the roadway and the sidewalk combined. So now, within the confines of this plan, there's no, uh, there's no attempt to address that surface water. It's just assumed that a pre-existing condition, which is actually already bad, is going to accommodate for infiltration and not have a negative impact on the people down slope of the proposed work. So what's going to be done? To address that, are we just going to ignore it and accept it? Uh, where well, it's a country road and everybody can just live with a flooded basement. I mean, what are we going to do about it? Now's the time to look at the question. At least, you know, you've got experts here, you've got engineers here that can address the situation. I mean, who determined what the scope of work was with respect to the improvements on the road? And the sidewalk. Mr. Chairman, yep. if I could, um, I think as we described uh, last time, uh, for a good length of Rafferty uh, from Wilson down, uh, except right near the end at Cedar Street, we are proposing uh, basically an infiltration trench. And what we've done at Beta's suggestion uh, is we've actually changed that from a grass-lined uh, trench to stone-lined trench, and it actually has a subdrain installed in there that will actually infiltrate some of the water that, that's running running across the existing 20-foot pavement, 20-foot paved area of Rafferty, uh, and collect that and in infiltrate some of that. Uh, the, what doesn't get captured in that runs across the sidewalk and down basically the grass slope uh, towards the wetland, and that will be some of that will be uh, filtered and infiltrated. In in the, in the side slope prior to hit, hitting the wetland. So it, it's a better situation than it is now, based, uh, based on the introduction of the, of the sidewalk. So and the the, the houses area. that have flooded basements now, which end of, of uh, Rafferty. not Rafferty, uh, the reservoir. reservoir, where are they? Are they close to Wilson Street or are they the, close the to the lake? The first three houses, the first three houses when you come from Wilson down Kruger, those houses that on that level, their, their lawns become, at least one of my neighbours, John Bush's house, which yes, is number five, gets his lawn becomes a quagmire in the spring. This is, this is higher. This is higher. Yeah. 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 If I look at the topo, I don't think those houses get it from Rafferty Road, but well, they, they don't. They, they, they're, they're off of Wilson Street. I'll, I'll buy that. The problem's on Wilson Street, well, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know the people further down Kruger Road. Okay. But all I can tell you is what's going on right now. Now, if there's no... The point at, at which this whole project starts is accepting that the existing conditions are accessible. 
Mr. Chairman, I think if anything, with the drainage work we're doing here, we're actually improving the situation. And if you look at, if you come in from Wilson coming down Rafferty, the grades actually rise up a bit beyond over and through here. So I don't see anything that'd be doing here that's affecting the houses down at Kruger. Now, what's happening, you brought up a good point. I think the way Wilson drops down and then swells around, I'm sure water is running down Wilson. I don't mm -hmm. think it's coming from Rafferty. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the next item that we've got is, is trees, and then we want to try to come to a conclusion tonight on this, if possible. I, I, I'm going to sum it up with what I hope is a consensus of the board is if we're going to build the sidewalk, which we think is needed, uh, that we're going to lose some trees. I mean, yeah, I, mean, I don't know anything, you know, different. Uh, the, the trails committee is looking at this as a potential trail that connects and loops from the state park and then they they have plans to connect along 85 to get down to, from the center trail and kind of bring it all in there and this trail will then bring it along to get over to Legacy Farms Road North which if you're anything like Legacy Farms Road South, there isn't a day I go by that I don't see at least one or two people walking, if not a, a lot more, if I'm going out at a certain time. So, you know, I think that the dog walking folks need need a sidewalk or they're going to, you know, we're going to have uh, major problems with it. So, uh, uh, and I think all those items were considered during the master plan special permit process where we required all these uh, conditions to go in and into it. So I think it's a necess necess necessary evil, per se. Uh, does anyone else have a different view of that on the planning board? And then comments from the public? Just a question the sidewalk, Mr. Chairman, or sure. meandering path, or Both. I, sorry, I missed it earlier. I, I mean, it's, it's a five-foot walkway and made out of uh, asphalt is what what is proposed i did notice some good sized trees and you know they are kind of right near where you need to put it i just wondered whether um this is going to be a sidewalk primarily as long as the shelter stays there this is going to be a sidewalk primarily designed for those people it's not like a regular pedestrian sidewalk to walk to the bus or whatever um whether I mean, something meandering to avoid some of those more significant trees that kind of went in through the, into. I mean, I would think the dog walkers would prefer to be able to walk a little further away from the traffic. Is I, there I, any? So I will tell you that we, we, believe me, we don't want to cut any more trees than necessary. Oh, no. Frankly, it costs us more money, and the bigger the tree, the more it costs. So if I could avoid every big tree, right. I'd right. be thrilled to do yeah. it. That being said, we studied where it can go, where it can't, and by the mm -hmm. way, where is the property line? Because a property line is not that far off the street. Now, we, we got Eversource to agree to allow us to do some transitional grading on their property because even as tight as it is, we still have to transition grade to their property. But they didn't want the sidewalk on their property per se. So when you look at the location, the walk does meander a bit, not a lot, but a bit in, in some spots. And the concern was if you drive it further back, you're actually going to cut down more trees. Mm -hmm. And so that was sort of the dilemma. So the question is, and to say nothing of drainage and wetlands and yeah. you know all the rest of that kind of thing. The so wetland impacts were significantly more. Mm -hmm. Actually, we, Ken and I walked that yeah. a, a couple of times, five or six months ago, looking at where could it go. And I actually flagged it out once with the engineers, and then I flagged it again because I tried to avoid. Tra at one point, we had 225 trees that were going to come down, and that's why we changed it and changed it. We got it down. By the way, the 117 is not just on Rafferty. I'm going to guess it's probably like maybe 80 or maybe 75 in Rafferty, and this, the rest of them are over on Cedar Street where the road widening is mm -hmm. happening. So it's not just <coughs> Rafferty. And that 100-plus mm -hmm. trees is over a half a mile. Mm -hmm. So it's, and, I, and, I, and I, for those who want to take a look at it, I can also hand a few of these out. Um, it gives you an idea of, you know, the amount of, I mean, we're talking thousands and thousands of trees here. and. I think once you put the sidewalk in and you take out these few trees, 
I think you're going to find you still have a significant, I mean, you still have a significant amount of trees. It's, it's basically forested on both sides. Mm -hmm. So it isn't like you're losing something of, of, of great magnitude. But you're losing, it, what you're losing, Roy, is the entire feel of the road. There's a canopy on that road. You've got no development around the road until your development goes up on the top. It's got a feel that's unique in the town. Um, and it seems to me that it, the, what's happening here with this design is that the heavy equipment's going to come in and they're cutting this swath as Beta's engineer expresses it in his reviews of fifth, 10 to 15 feet off the edge of the road for expediency's purposes, right? Absolutely. To get the equipment but, but, in. But that's absolutely false. The, there's nothing to do with expediency. Number one, as I mentioned, there's a property line not too far off the road. Number one. Number two, there's wetlands off the road. Right. And so if you were to drive it any further back, you're swapping cutting trees A and B for cutting trees C and D. So it's not really a, an either or. Yeah, so so it's, 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 and you're into more wetlands. So are you there's saying, no perfect solution. Are you saying that the basis engineer is incorrect? In what he stated in the peer review? I don't know what he said. I don't know what you're referring to. Well, he's saying he expresses in the peer review, both on the early part of, um, of October and the latter part of October, his latest peer review, that they're cutting a 10 foot to 15 foot swath parallel to Rafferty Road as exists right now. Are you telling me that's not the case? Well, wait a minute. Let's be clear. I mean, you say cutting a swath. No. Are we cutting a line of delineation of roughly 10 feet to create a five-foot sidewalk and a berm? Correct, we are. Okay. And is there a property line, I'll pick a number, that may be 20 feet off, 15 feet off the street, right. that goes the whole length of the street, which is a public right away? Yes, we are. So short of, you know, meandering 30, 40, 50 feet on someone else's property, there's no other way to do the sidewalks. The only other option is not do the sidewalk at all. So when we looked at the meandering option, to Roy's point, um, because of the grading impacts and the fact that that kind of drops off so drastically with the wetlands, not only is, let's, let's turn away from wetlands, but not only is the wetland impact a lot greater, because of the, the irregularity, if you will, of the slope, the highs and the lows, we ended up cutting and filling so much, the trees, the amount of trees that were being impacted, to Roy's point, were significantly more by having that mm -hmm. meandering offset from the road, if you will. Because you basically, when you think about it, you're going through a forest, right, that isn't flat. Right near the edge of the road, yes, it drops off, but it's roughly, it's somewhat consistent along the edge of the road. If you go 10, 20 feet into the woods, it's a lot more irregular. And in order to make that flat, to put the paved path, you're cutting and filling and you're doing, cutting a lot more trees down to make that construction possible. Um, can, I, can I ask, those trees that you'd be cutting down, you see you're cutting down a lot more. Um, are you saying that you'd be cutting in all the way from the roadway in or, or just no, within there? Correct. We wouldn't have been touching the ones near the edge of the road there, right. but the, the, sw the path, if you will, in order to create this walking right. path, would have been larger had no. we made it meandering and, and it been set farther back from the road mm -hmm. because of the grading irregularities with, mm -hmm. the, with the topography. But, but yeah. there's another issue one has to take into account. Even if you were to move the walk back, which you can't because of property lines and mm -hmm. wetlands, even if you were to do that, you're going to significantly damage those remaining trees' roots in the process of excavating gravel bases mm -hmm. and putting the surface on it to say nothing of the trees over time, frankly, lifting and, and yeah. contorting the walk a bit. So uh, I, can, I can fully agree with everyone's concern about cutting trees down. I mm -hmm. totally get it. I, I'm not a fan of cutting these trees down, but there's no other way to reasonably do this walkway without taking more trees, or at least taking these trees. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only other option, frankly, is doing no walkway at all. Mm -hmm. One other thing, is the situation with the trees, uh, the caliber of the trees, any better on the other side of the street? No, as a matter of fact, the other side of the street would be much worse because you've got the drainage swale going down the whole uh -huh. line. Okay. And on that side of the street, you have to cross the street. I, I, mean, I think we, we actually looked at this seven years ago. There's the big ones on that yeah. side. We actually looked at this seven years ago and trying to have a consistency of having the walker down that side. It made the most sense. Can okay. I ask, can yeah. I Last you? question, because we've got to get going. And, and then Mavis will be next. We're already 15 minutes beyond where we have to be. Okay. On, on, the, on the sidewalk, even if you was to stay with the existing plan in terms of its route, does it make a significant difference if you follow the existing topography of the land and not have to do so much fill and just do trimming off 
So you're back to grade as the existing road? Um, unfortunately, we come across ADA compliance issues, and what's one of the reasons why we have some retaining walls in some spots and fill with a riprap slope in other spots, because if we f if follow the undulation, it would be a lot easier for us to do, but we wouldn't meet compliance. Yeah, I know you have to add the 5% yep. grade right. Right on, on the path. Yep. And if you do greater than that, you have to have a landing every 30 feet, from what I read on ADA, mate. Well, but it would probably be more than that if we're 10 or 12 percent, because some places it's, it rises quite significantly. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's, okay. I, I, I appreciate what you're saying. I believe Mavis, me, I, I, think I don't want to do this. <laughs> I don't. The sidewalk must be five feet wide? I believe that's an ADA right, requirement, yeah. too, well, isn't it? I'm thinking of the close? sidewalk that runs along East Main Street now. I don't think that's five feet that, wide. That's five feet. Is it really? The new one we just put in? Well, is that is yeah. it ADA, ADA compliant? It's, it's five feet wide. Is yeah. it ADA yeah. compliant? Yeah. And it can go as little as three feet if, if there's an obstruction that's a problem to move. Hmm. You're allowed in, to in, in an isolated location, you're correct. I think my only other comment <laughs> is that I would hope that Rafferty Road and other roads that are impacted by taking trees down don't look like the intersection at Legacy Farms Road South and East Main Street. That has been butchered so much, it's unbelievable. And I know that there are going to be trees put in and replaced, but they will be small trees. It'll be 25, 30 years before they get to where we, where the trees were that were taken out. Mm -hmm. And I understand that some trees needed to be moved so we can put a big roadway through there. But I'm just saying, I think for us who have been in Hopkinton for a long time, and we appreciate the beauty of the trees, and that's one of our outstanding rural characteristics, is the presence of our trees. Um, I'd just like to point that out. I okay, thank not you. Want to see another thank you. No, no, no. Yeah, the uh, I understand the, your concerns about the intersection. Uh, this board uh, signed the death warrant on a bunch of trees on Ash Street to build a sidewalk recently, which is pretty well con done. And quite frankly, other than the fact that I know where all the trees were that I was, and I go by that a lot, most places there was another laurel of trees behind it, and you don't notice it too much. Well, I knew you would be taking care of Ash Street, so I didn't come up with <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, if I, if I could make one comment to Mavis's comment about uh, the intersection of um, East Main and the Legacy North and South, I actually agree with you 100%. Right now it looks like hell. And trust me, before we're done, working in conjunction with Peter and Wayne and working in conjunction with our own property at 83 East Main Street. 83 East Main Street right now looks like a house of horrors. But once we get that road finished and we get that site landscaped and the stone walls rejuvenated, and we need to put some more uh, major trees at the intersection where it meets where Peach used to be in that area. We will be doing that. It'll look a lot, lot better. Okay. Let's try to wrap this up. With Lane on page two of the memo had, uh, had Four conditions, and condition three says that the board of its agent may approve field modifications or to retain trees during construction. I would say the board or the tree warden. Wouldn't that be its agent? Well, it could be an agent, but I would say the tree warden. We've, we've delegated that to them on other mm -hmm. streets. Sure. And then we'd be adding line stripes and revisit if the center uh, village center has built uh, the Q, Q length. Uh, Elaine, did we have any other conditions we had to add to this? No, that was it. Now, you had cautioned us not to vote this until we finished the master plan special permit hearing. Well, it was only until you discussed the two possible road widths which you have. Oh, okay. So you're okay? Because we have the authority in this thing to re approve a, a shorter or mm -hmm. narrow road. Okay, so given all that, any other comments, questions from members of the board? I'd entertain a motion to approve the Rafferty Cedar Street with those five conditions. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Further discussion? Seeing none, how do you vote? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstained? Motion carries. Okay, now before you get going, we've got the master plan special permit. Uh, do I have to open the hearing today, formally? Yes, and you can, yes, and you can continue it to another date if that's, if that's the board's pleasure. 
uh, given that we're running out of time for the rest of the meeting, because uh, we have to open it because we, we have, we're time constrained on that. And it is advertised. And it is advertised. Okay, so we will uh, open the public hearing application to amend Legacy Farms Master Plan Special Permit. Which is increase the number of dwelling units to 180 units. Let's do about five minutes on that to, to maybe just get board members' comments and questions, and uh, maybe, and then we'll continue it on, and, and then we're all set. And I'll start off some of the comments and questions. When I read what was in the memo and the conditions, they all seem to be very confusing to me. I think that was Elaine's comment. Uh, and I don't know why you would, you either, I think, have to pick the 180 or the commercial. I don't understand why we're, with a master plan special permit, that we're continuing the option. But maybe that's just me. It certainly gets a lot easier if you decide. Right now, you have the commercial. And if you decide to go with the residential, go with the residential. Mr. Chairman, I, I think the thinking on that was until such time as the planning board actually approved site plan approval, we just wanted to keep the option for whatever reason if you didn't approve it, that we had something to do with it. Okay. You kind of have that either way, but... Well, I think, I, I think you know, if, if it needs to be clarified, we're happy to clarify that. Well, I suggest we take some time and, and have Elaine kind of work with you with some language that people can understand. That's fine. And That's what happens when you use a high-priced lawyer. I understand. That's <laughs> probably the problem. In a couple of engineers, we'd have it made. But, uh, okay. Uh, entertain a motion to continue to December 21st at 7.30 p.m. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Um, That's what you said, December 21st at 7.30. Uh, seeing no further discussion, how do you vote? Aye. 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 Anyone Aye. opposed? Anyone abstain? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Now this, for board members, let's uh, try to get rid of some other stuff so that in 10 minutes we can continue on with the last two public hearings. Uh, First one is a uh, bridle path subdivision request for performance guarantee release. The town has accepted that uh, subdivision. We have some money left over, I think. Yes. And Elaine, we got to give it back, huh? Yes. We have to give it back. Okay. So I'm looking to uh, what is it to release all the the bonds? The remaining. So there will be some interest to the. To re 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 release the remaining money for bridal path. Try to see where it is. Oh, it's page on page, ten. page ten. So, page it's, so, it's, so it's releasing forty-two hundred and forty-two thousand dollars. Right. And and interest. Plus interest. Okay. So you want to make the motion, Brian? Uh, yes, I move that we uh, release the amount of $42,180. Um, plus interest. Plus interest. Do I hear a second? Second. 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 Further discussion? Seeing none, how do you vote? Aye. Aye. Anyone Aye. opposed? Anyone abstain? Motion Aye. carries. Okay, Conley Hill Estates. Performance guarantee reduction. This has to do with the berm. Or the, I think it was a berm. Cracks in the curbing, curbing, and not berm. So this is to re re reduce the amount to fifty thousand eight hundred thirty-four. I know I talked to John Westerling about that. He was comfortable with with that. So yeah, I think Elaine did too. What? Do you know the fact that he was? They were okay with the current situation. Okay. So uh, we would move to reduce the amount from 68,834 to 50,834. Do I hear a second? Second. Second. Further discussion? Seeing none, how do you vote? Aye. 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 Anyone Aye. opposed? Anyone abstain? Motion carries. We'll wait on number one Lumber Street until uh, Paul comes here. Uh, looking for the minutes of 928 
2015. They were in your packet last time. We never got to them. Uh, anyone have any comments to those? If I see no comments, entertain the motion to approve 9, 8, 28, 15 minutes. So moved. Second. Nope. Moved and seconded. Seeing no further discussion, how do you vote? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? Motion carries. Um, for minutes of uh, October 5th, 2015. Any comments, questions, corrections? Seeing none, I entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Moved. Second. No. Seeing no further discussion, how do you vote? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? Motion carries. Okay, I'm leaving master plan update on here. I'm just going to say those people that haven't got your sections in, you're overdue. And detentions will be... Uh, uh -oh. uh, demerits. Demerits and detentions, you know. Uh, but we we got to keep moving on that to meet the goal. I, uh, but tonight we don't have time to, to do much more. So other than other than issuing pleads for, for getting to work, uh, that's, I think, the only update we have today. I oh. have one point of order. Sure. Uh, I, I was voting off staying for the 10, 5 minutes because I haven't oh. seen the video yet either, so I wasn't here, so I'm abstaining from that vote. Okay. And let's see. Correspondence. I don't that's, we got the notice from the Board of Appeals. Um, Christian Estates. This is to re-sign a... A form K that released two of the subdivision lots. Apparently there was an error in the plan reference, so they're asking the Board to re-sign that. So, Same lots. So we need a motion to uh, re-sign uh, Form K release. <laughs> this will release a couple of lots. So moved. Second. Second. Oh. Uh, not seeing any further discussion. How do you vote? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? Motion carries. Five signatures. Five signatures. There's also a 745 hearing to continue. Okay. Oh, thank you. The uh, 745 hearing, we have a, did we have a proposed time we for that? We haven't asked for a particular date, so I'm suggesting the next meeting, um, the 16th at 7, uh, excuse me, 8 o'clock. November 16th at 8 p.m. Yeah. Okay, look for a motion to continue to that date. So moved. Second. Seconded. Abstained. Uh, abstain. Uh, okay, any further discussion? So none, how do you vote? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? Aye. One. Uh, okay. I think we've gotten rid of all the other stuff that we need to do. Uh, any board member comments or liaison reports or anything like that? Uh, future agenda items? Yeah. We got five? Okay, great. Okay, so. Geez, now I got here four minutes early. <laughs> Thank you very much for all your, your, your quick work. Well, I'm going to take a five-minute water break because we are done with all the business and that we can do, and then I'm going to get organized. So and I'll try to get the applicant in our hall if I can find him.
overhead electric service for number one Lumber Street, which is of Paul's interest. Uh, Lane, do you want to kind of lay out where where your feedback is in talking with Eversource and everything else like that? I think the question came up is the status of when the connection can go across Lumber Street underground to connect to the new building. And so Eversource replied to me that um, the DPW had confirmed to them so that they that the uh, the utilities and so forth were marked. So they went out and uh, they're working to c complete the. Um, what they call it, grant of location and rights. And so once they do that, they will seek Board of Selectmen approval for the conduit uh, street crossing. And I asked uh, when um, that would be occurring. They didn't have a date for that, but they know it's a priority for the town. Okay. I think we actually have any news on that, too. Um, I think that's pretty consistent with the update we have. As far as the granting, um, we got the documents today, as a matter of fact, and we've signed the rights so that they have access and such, so we have that as of today. Um, but we've still been waiting on the date and obviously pushing and working with the road closing moratorium and the dates around that. Yeah. So the, the DPW has issued the road opening permit, so they're okay, they're ready to go whenever the Board of Selectmen approves that. Okay. So it's, the Board of Selectmen would have to approve a new poll, too, so it's kind of the same criteria. We're in a lot better shape now in the last few days. Good. We have, well, we that. Right. Elaine did a great job. I, I, like yes. usual. Anyway, at this point, let's see if what time I'm seeing here. I've still got a couple minutes. I'm waiting for 8.15. How many folks from the public are here for this particular hearing? Okay, that makes it maybe easier or not. Am I allowed to complain, Ken, even though I'm going to talk about the project? If, if uh, public is more than welcome to talk about the tennis club in four minutes. If I thought we'd be so efficient on all the other stuff, we would have given, given somebody we would have given somebody else another four minutes before we continued their hearing. I would have taken the over, Ken. I will tell you right now. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, we're not quite there. Have you guys gotten the hearing that we notice or uh, outline that we typically do? I'm not. Oh, let's get some of those over here. Get all this. We try to follow an outline just to, in order to kind of not go over things again and again and again and work towards issuing the, the approvals. So we'll start off with that. And at 8.15 when I public, open the public hearing in two and a half minutes, then you'll, you'll be ready for an introduction. Explains why our viewership is down so much due to all this dead air time. <laughs> Anyone have any good one and a half minute stories? <laughs> Are they done with the uh, sidewalk on Wood Street? You go by it every day, obviously. It's looking good. Looking good? East or West it Main Street? It doesn't go right to my house, though. Not quite. Right. Not quite. You couldn't do anything like that? <laughs> no. yeah. Is this round stopping at the church? or is it, it stops just a little into the church. Um, it's to Proctor Street, basically, I think. <laughs> and uh, and uh, people that are going by the West Main, I haven't been by there in a couple of days. Is that one also probably the same status? The same people walking on it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. Mm -hmm. They don't have the top layer on though, right? No, but people are using it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think it is. Well, it's close. That clock is a few minutes early. 
Okay, let's uh, open the public hearing for site plan review. This is uh, Zero Lumber Street, uh, Hopkinton Tennis Club, and this is a site plan review. As I mentioned, we will be trying to follow this outline. We have abilities for the public to talk throughout the, uh, the process, uh, particularly in the detailed discussions. And on item four, we'll all add to the outline if we think there's other things that we needed to add to it. With this uh, project introduction and review, uh, introduce yourself, please. And Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, my name is Mark Donahue. I'm with Fletcher Tilton in Framingham. And I have the pleasure of representing Crandall Hicks Company, Inc. with regard to their application for site plan review. With me at the table are Don Satterfield, the president of uh, Crandall Hicks uh, and the owner, uh, and Jesse Johnson from Bowler Engineering, uh, who will be making the detailed presentation. There's a cast of uh, people behind, uh, which uh, are here to answer any questions that the board may have with regard to the application, as we can try to give you as much information as you need to try to move forward to an approval. Very briefly, the, uh, what you have before you is an application for uh, what was shown on the master plan as Lot 7, the most southerly lot uh, of the um, na neighborhood mixed-use spe uh, master special permit approved by this board back in March. Uh, it is for construction of a th uh, little over 39,000 square foot two-story building to be used as a, a racket and swim club uh, that we can describe in more detail. It, the facility will have with it 10 tennis courts. Uh, four will be permanently uh, have a roof over them or, or, or covered. Six will be covered on a seasonal basis. It will also have a swimming pool facility that will also be have seasonal covering as far as it's located. Uh, it, it is site plan review as indicated by the chair during the approval uh, pursuant to your bylaw, and we'd be glad to answer any specific questions as we go through uh, the process. Do you want to give a little bit of overview of the project? Uh, Show the board a little sure. bit what, what's going on at this point. How you want to follow we're, this agenda? We're, we're going to get we're going to get into all the details. So you just give a couple minute overview. Okay. Please. I can give you some handouts so you can play the home game. Right. That makes it easier. Okay. Pass those down. Jesse Johnson, Bowler Engineering. So for those of you that haven't seen the, the project before. If you're familiar with the location, this is also called Lot 7 on the Master Plan Special Permit that was done. It's down uh, Lumber Street. And what we're looking to do here is provide a tennis and fitness club facility located in the central location of the lot. It'll have 10 tennis courts, uh, four, as you see, situated behind the building here that will be covered year round. And then you'll have six also courts that will be covered seasonally. We also have a pool facility on the outside uh, for adults and another children's area uh, for swimming facilities. The pool area will be covered uh, seasonally as well. That's the current plan. And then to access the site, you'll come off the front of Lumber Street with one primary entrance in and out with parking situated in front with circulation around the site uh, for 123 parking spaces. Uh, we feel the parking is adequate given the size of the building. The building is two floors with just over 19,500 square feet per floor, or a total of about 39,000 square feet of area. It was designed at the two floors to take advantage of uh, some restrictions that were on the lot that we uh, didn't want to encumber any further. We have wetlands surrounding the property pretty much on three sides all the way around, and their buffer zones do come into the property, which we show here in red. So we had some restrictions that made it challenging to meet all the program needs, but also adhere to the local requirements for your planning, but also uh, some of the state requirements for stormwater. Uh, we think we did a, a good job fitting that in and, and essentially threading the needle with all those requirements. Uh, we went through a number of different iterations to come to this, so we feel we vet out a lot of the problems, and what we have before you is, is what we feel is the best product we can, we can come up with for this project. Uh, we do have, obviously, on-site facilities for stormwater controls, we were careful to design locations throughout the site on the perimeter to spread out that stormwater, which is really a, a guiding principle that they want to see at the state level and also usually the local level. You want to make sure you're putting the stormwater back into the ground in as many places as you possibly can. So we have those around the perimeter. We also have three of them that are underground, uh, one here, one here, and one here. So we have a number of spots. We 
comply with local bylaws, we comply with the state bylaws, and we're actually providing an access of what's typically re required for our stormwater treatment. Uh, we're also extending utilities down to the site for water. Uh, we'll extend gas into the site and electric as well. We will have on-site septic. Uh, there's no sewer available. Uh, we have located an area here in the front that we'll have for sewage disposal. That plan will be submitted this week to your Board of Health. Uh, we've already gone through the design process so to make sure that the grading and some of the other restrictions associated with septic systems was already vetted out prior to finalizing this design so we feel confident that what you have before you isn't going to change as a result of a septic design. Uh, we did try to size, size that conservatively and size for 300 lockers which is a Title V guidance that you can use so that will back us into how many locker spaces you can have for people that are going to use the facility. So we feel good about that. Uh, we've also gone through and done a real nice landscaping uh, design for the site, paying careful attention to really dressing up the frontage of the lot, but also even doing interior landscaping throughout of the different varieties and species that you can see on the landscape plan in more detail. We do have the natural benefit of having uh, wooded buffers around three sides of the, the property, which is a substantial benefit. I can give you a brief aerial overview so you can kind of see that a little more dramatically. So this is our, our spot right here. And you can see this is an open space parcel that's going to be designated forever to be protected. Then you have the Sportsman's Club down in this direction here. And to give you a scale, that's about a thousand feet right there. So you get about a thousand feet from our property line until you start to get to the effective use area for the sportsman's club. And here across the street you see two of the industrial zone parcels that are in use. And then also we have obviously lighting design for the site. Uh, we did design it with 22 foot poles. Uh, we have uh, discussed with some of the local officials that we are not in compliance with your bylaw that requires 15, but we would like to go into some detail about why we are proposing the 22 and we think it's a better fit than the 15 and maybe asking for a formal waiver. Uh, one of the other waivers we're asking for is for the extension of the sidewalk across the entire frontage. We did notice that your bylaws require that or ask for it. Um, we think that going with the sidewalk down across the frontage to this point uh, really is a sidewalk to nowhere. Uh, we didn't think encouraging pedestrian travel, as I was mentioning, if you allow me to flip that over, towards the sportsman's club or toward, uh, there's no other facilities that can be developed there, uh, we thought wouldn't be of, of benefit to anybody. So we thought we would concentrate on just a sidewalk connection piece that maybe potentially could go up to the north. And going back to that. So as I mentioned, we've had everything in compliance outside of that with your local guidelines, but also taking into consideration the design guidelines that were in the master plan special permit that have control over this parcel. Um, we do have a couple areas that we would need some recognition from the board specifically to have stormwater controls within your side yard offsets. Uh, this basin here, uh, this basin that we show into the open space parcel, and another one over here that really were just a direct result of not having any other choice to put them in any other location. Uh, we, we really vetted that out as much as we could and feel as though we have the best design uh, that we can put forward in that regard. But that's a general overview and I'm sure we can talk in more detail about some of the other points. Thank you. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on to Elaine's comments and can you comment on where we are in receiving of documents and stuff like that too, please. Uh, we received some revised um, plans after the board's mailing this week. Uh, those were reviewed by beta, so you have a revised letter this evening, uh, mostly related to stormwater but changes. We, but we haven't, but you haven't seen those revised plans, but I think it was mostly stormwater related, so the plans before you are for, for upper level review. It's, it's not, it's not we did also receive uh, late Friday uh, building plans, um, but uh, electronically, but not on paper yet. And once we have those, we can verify the parking requirements by looking at the square footage and the uses of the building. So the, the parking requirements have not been verified yet. 
Okay, so uh, the expectation for the members of the board is we will probably not be approving today because we've got these outstanding things basically due to submittals that were a little late. And I did want to add that the design review will be reviewing the, the building plans at its meeting this month, which is the third Tuesday. So, so when we schedule the second one, we want to have it after that. Okay. Other comments? Questions? Okay. Uh, Beto, how, how, where are you? Uh, uh, we've we've uh, we issued the original set of uh, comments to which we've received responses. Uh, the majority of the issues are, are closed. Okay. We've had sufficient responses. Um, I think most of the ones are actually already mentioned. The request to waive the requirement of the sidewalk, we would uh, suggest the board discuss that in more detail. Uh, and the traffic assessment, we had some questions about some of the, uh, the trips and the uh, uh, additional square footage that was additional from what was in the master plan. Um, also in the uh, stormwater, some of the infiltration chambers were uh, close to groundwater. We've made some suggestions for some changes, which they have uh, they have done, but we're additionally suggesting that when when that excavation is done, that it be monitored to make sure that the assumptions that were made uh, are verified. So that would be a condition, I believe? We'll talk about that in yeah, a little bit. We'll talk about it. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think that was. And then the lighting was the other the other issue that was still on the table. Your data is also doing the review for the CONCOM also. Yes. Where where is the CONCOM? Do you, do you know where they I are? I don't know where CONCOM is. I can answer I that. It was for them tonight as well. Oh. We just actually had it uh, closed and approved. Closed and approved, basic substantially as presented to us. Correct. Well, that's good news. Mm. They were go they were waiting on the premise of stormwater, and we felt comfortable with our stormwater design. Okay, so they they are allowing stuff to go into their hundred foot buffer. Yes. Okay. As close as 50, 50 close. feet, and actually grading up to uh, thirty eight feet. Okay. So, well, that's a big hurdle. Okay. I think we're, we're through the, the, the first three here, so we're moving right along. Item number four, planning board members and the public get to add to the agenda if, if needed. Uh, I added one based on uh, the beta's comments of just adding the word traffic, just to go through that extra, and explain the square footage. Uh, any board members have others that you would like to add to our which is norm our normal list. So I'll, I'll go, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Kind of piggybacking on the <coughs> traffic comment. Well, what about any type of commercial traffic? Right? So you got vendors coming in at all? What I say commercial, like vendors coming in, doing mm -hmm. dropping off their, I don't know. I assume there's going to be some food or what have mm -hmm. you, or towels or you know, things of that nature. Um, I would just add that to the, to the list. Okay. Anyone from the public interested in adding? To, to our our list. Okay, why don't I? Well, go ahead. Ah, gun control. Or not gun control. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> gun sound. I'll, I'll, I'll recover in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Bob Draper. I'm from Hoppington Sportsman's Association, and I just wanted to ask uh, that the board be aware. As the gentleman pointed out, that there is a sportsman's club beside us, and I'd like to include in your minutes this portion regarding the uh, mass law and any noise as it relates to ranges, and I'll be more than happy to supply the gentleman here with a uh, copy of that also. Thank you. If somebody would have a business card for yourselves, um, that would be helpful to me. And if anybody has any questions about that, thank you very much. We were concerned about the noise of the swimmers, you understand, and the tennis players <laughs> affecting our skeet shooters. That was <laughs> 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 uh, given that you've shown up at the last several of our hearings like this, I assume you'd like us to put in a similar clause that we've done before? We, we would. There will be one forthcoming as, a, as, as it goes along further from our attorney to 
Okay. The vote is just to ensure that there's no question that it was done, that's all. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Yep. Chairman? Yes, go ahead. That, that road, uh, Lumber Street, there's a, a windy road in there that's very narrow. Is there going to be any upgrading to that with all this traffic? We'll add that as a list to talk about. Okay. Brian? Um, I don't see anything in here about snow removal, uh, mechanical screening, the usual. Mechanical screening, we're going to give it to them anyway. Yeah. Uh, snow removal, okay. <coughs> Any other? Or, or storage. Or snow removal storage. Okay. Okay, so now I think I see none, no, no other ones from the members of the public. Let's go down, and I'm going to pick and choose from the detailed discussion. It's not going to go right down the, the line because I want to get some of the hot button ones so that if you have any redesign, you can get it done between now and then. So that we'll have some interim consensus of the board. So I, the first one that I saw that I think you're doing pretty good on the stormwater. In fact, you're probably pretty close to there. So we're not going to talk about that tonight. Let's talk about oh, site. Oh, Let's talk about it's first. It's still on the list, though. It's still on the list. Thank we will get them all. We're just going to pick the ones so that they can do their homework before the next meeting and we get it done. Uh, let's start with uh, site lighting. And there is a waiver request on that, so obviously there's a discussion on that. So, Yeah, and if I could hand out another material just again to make it a little bit easier. I've highlighted in blue an alternative to the design that we've submitted to you. Uh, we've submitted the 22-foot pole design. I'll flip that up and show you on the board. And what I've just handed out to you in a reduced fashion is the 15-foot design. So here's, here's the one in the plan set that's submitted. You'll notice more that I've highlighted there's only 12 fixtures that would be required, 12 pole mounts that would be required to meet the lighting levels that you cite in your standards. And if we have to go to the 15 feet, which is another requirement you have, we can do that. Uh, but what it does, is it pushes it to 27 fixtures, which more than doubles the number of fixtures, but we cannot comply with the light level standard that you cite as being a requirement. So we have to pick between the two. And the reason that is, is we only have one location that we can put our septic system. It's a substantial size septic system. The soils are not ideal for a septic. It's, they're not the worst in the world, but they're not the best. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty sizable system. And because of the grades out there and the separation that we need from groundwater, it requires us to put it up front. And when you do that, you put that septic system, which is really in a big footprint, we have to spread the lights around the perimeter of it. And because we're trying to meet a certain light level in the middle of where that septic is, that means we've got to use a brighter lumen, brighter bulb on that light, but also we've got to use more of them, or we can go up higher. So that's why we chose to go with the 22 feet, because in our opinion, we thought aesthetically less poles would look better, and we could also meet that lighting standard that you guys require. Um, we can certainly do the 15 feet and drop it down, but we will not be able to meet the ratio. It goes actually from a 17 1 to a 41 to 1. And your requirement is a 20 to 1. If I may ask, yeah. um, this lighting bylaw is new, and we're just starting to actually implement it. It was passed like last year, I believe, um, with the 15 foot. I, I'm hesitant to immediately start waiving what we put in. Um, and, and some of these ISNA guidelines are a little hard to understand or follow. So I don't quite, un I don't quite know what you mean when you say you can't meet it because I was looking through the uh, foot candles shown on your 22 foot plan and I I'm seeing lighting levels that we haven't seen in any of the recently permitted plans. I'm seeing lighting levels in some of these aisles I've seen <coughs> sevens, fours, fives, um, 
reading some of these, uh, your, your chart down here, it says a maximum 3.5, minimum 0.6. And as I said, I was seeing 4s, 5s, 6s, 7s. We've been trying very hard to bring the light levels down in this town, and, and particularly with the uh, preponderance now of the LED lights, which are a very intense light. Part of the reason for the lower poles is when you have a tall pole, like a 22-foot pole, you're looking up into the light source, and that's what provides, is, is glaring to the eye, and a 22-foot pole, you know, you're going to be looking at a 22-foot <coughs> LED light. Um, the lighting plan that you had, there's spillover into the side. Um, you know, you seem to have a lot of light in places where it's not needed, like in driving aisles where you're going to be in a car with headlights. Um, so I, I, I was a little surprised that these are the light levels that supposedly comply because the recent plans we've, pr we've approved for new developments don't come anywhere near this. Um, I really not, think you could bring these down. Sure, I, I can try to touch upon that. I'm not sure what the other sites look like. I don't know if they had uh, the size parking lot we had or maybe just the, the layout. It, some of it does fall on geometry. You only have a certain number of islands available to you to put light poles in. And the standards that we're being asked to adhere to are a minimum of a 0.2 foot candle in any region. It doesn't matter if it's in the access aisle where your vehicle is or a pedestrian walkway, but it says 0.2 minimum. Mm -hmm. foot candle and what we provided on the one that we've submitted the 22 foot is a half a foot candle on the minimum side and then the max is eight and a half so that's what allows us to stay into that 20 to 1 ratio that ratio is nothing more than dividing your your average max by your average minimum and unfortunately when we go to the 15 feet we do the best we can we more than double the number of fixtures as you can see in the blues they're spread out throughout the site but that's still just to try to meet those minimum standards of the, the point two. We we got point three on a low, and but our high is unfortunately 12.4, and that's because you have to put so much in one area to make it spread so far that you're you're sacrificing that spot directly below the light to try to make something better far away. And with more poles, you don't have to do this, but you can concentrate your light more. Right, we've got 27 on there now. Uh, even doing it more, we still are restricted by an interior area because of a substantial utility, the, se the septic system. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if I can make a comment, just not to you as much as to the board in general, um, again, we do know these are new. We've been struggling for years to try to get lighting guidelines. Um, we also struggled with trying to find a standard that was understandable. And I think we we settled on this ISNA thing, um, which is the is the professional organization for lighting. But um, you know, if if seeing the requirements we've put in as a board, and this is what they produce, maybe we should rethinking how, be rethinking how we wrote these. And rather than this applicant asking us for um, a waiver of our regulations, we should be. Uh, waiving the ISNA requirement because, again, I, I think if we look back on some of the recent projects permitted, and I do mean recent, like in the last year or two, I haven't seen seven and eight foot candles in anything. Um, and we've asked numerous applicants to knock the light level down, and they have. And I understand you're doing this not because this is what you want to do, but this is what we're telling you you should do. Uh, and I'm just saying to this board, I, I think if this is the first application of the new lighting bylaw, it, it, what it's producing it is off the walls. It's not consistent with what we've been building throughout the town, nor what we want or need. I, may add to that. Um, I think it's fair to also be able to give them feedback, though, because mm -hmm. uh, the first presentation is uh, uh, higher lights. Uh, they're not going to be playing tennis in the parking lot. Um, I think that if they look at us, if they look at our bylaw and, and look at it and come back with more scientific, another approach, just look at it another way, um, and you can make it work, uh, I, we'd appreciate it. Um, Which way would you like to make it work, by height or by the levels? Both. 
it's not, it's, it's, and it's, and this is, this is, it's not hard if, if you, you know, I'm not telling you what to do, but I would appreciate it if you tried. I understand. Uh, we have done a number of different iterations in-house. Um, I can certainly give it another shot. If you could give us a little bit of guidance as far as which way you would like to have it lean towards, only because there is an encumbrance, that septic system, that's it's hard to overcome because there is no other lot, no other space on the lot. There are a lot of like issues that all inter interrelate. So. Yeah, everything everything kind of dovetails into each other, and that really is the only spot for the septic. And we don't like it being underneath the parking if we could help it, but unfortunately, um, the soils are what they call a seed type of soil. It's again, it's not ideal, um, but it, it requires a lot of fill to come into the site to lift it up, uh, which is a tremendous expense um, to the applicant. Regardless. Um, we have to work with that, and that kind of sets the grade of the site, sets where some of these utilities have to go. Um, and we feel as though it's still a good design because we can keep the levels down at the frontage to have essentially 0 0.1 or nothing on the sides. We can still obtain all the really important things that we feel, which are the intrusion maybe out of body properties, the aesthetics on what you see from the front, we still think it looks good from the front because you're going to have a few poles to look at, and we have a lot of landscaping to help try to offset that and break it up. So let me, let me see if I try to understand this. If you go to the 22, we meet the uniformity requirement Correct. for sure, Correct. and the overall light levels at the 22 are high or low than where people are thinking they should be. Are there, Big big numbers on the 22 foot. The biggest one on the 22 is eight and a half eight. on the highest. Mm -hmm. And where, 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 where is that approximately? Those are usually falling right under the fixture itself. Okay. I'm seeing an eight and a half and a 7.7 .7 with the 15 foot poles. Yeah, those actually even went up. The 15s went up even higher, unfortunately, because we didn't have the height to take advantage of. We were maxing out at 12.4. Mm. So basically, we're, the 12 foot poles, we get worse uniformity in, in, in worst hot or hot spots, or 15 foot. So, Mr. Chairman, does the solution have to be binary, either or? Is there an no. option for a some type of combination? I know it goes outside of the the the, uh, the guidelines, but well, can I ask a question about sure. the bylaw? says that the property may have exterior lighting, may not have exterior lighting that exceeds the average illumination level recommended. It doesn't specify, I mean, it specifies an upper limit. It doesn't specify a number. Yeah, it just doesn't so exceed. I'm wondering if they can work within that and, you know, to, to lower that a bit. And it isn't just a waiver from the board, it's a special permit to reduce, mm -hmm. or to, to not meet the standards. And so, it's what the what that average illumination level is that sets the upper number. Mm -hmm. I mean, even with you know shaded fixtures, you've got your dark sky objectives. You talk, you'd have that much light hitting the parking lot. It bounces up, and this is where you get. You know, this is the whole concept of dark sky. You get areas where you can't even see the stars. And, and you may not have spill off the site, naturally there is spill off the site, but even if you don't have spill off the site, you have this intense amount of light on a parking lot, and your surrounding areas, you've got a glow. Um, and again, you know, for, for you this You won't site, see the lights for the glow from the tennis courts, Claire. Mm -hmm. No, 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 I'm, I'm serious, though. This is why, you, you know, communities are trying to keep the light levels down because cumulatively you've got the price chopper down the street, you've got 77 Main Street, you've got the Muse, you put all this together, and you've got a whole section of town that's got a, a cumulative massive amount of light and you, you literally can't see the stars. Um, and, and, and um, you know, I would be interested to look back at some recent permits that we've done between, you know, Price Chopper, Dunkin' Donuts, uh, the Hopkinton View, some other things, and I really question that we've been permitting things with light levels this high, and, and it's not the fault of this applicant if he's trying to meet what he thinks we're requiring, but, but I think we should really think twice, as you said, if it's an, ex if it's an, um, an upper limit, 
then we can bring that down as long as it's for, as it's for safety. Some of these areas, people are in their cars with headlights. They don't need that intense amount of light to find their way. Let, let me ask you this. What's an upper level that you would feel comfortable with that we could at least shoot for? Yeah. Well, I'm recalling that in recent plans, we've had planes that were in, you know, the one and a half, two, maybe upper of three foot candles. I, I'm not remembering anything with fives and sixes and sevens anywhere on the site. Yeah, I, honestly, I don't think we could achieve that only because of we would have dead zones in the middle of that septic area because of the size of it. What, what, what if you try a hybrid where you you have maybe the taller ones over the the, the mm -hmm. septic system and then Definitely bring work. the other ones down elsewhere? I and think we and then could, yeah. could you also then put the, the context of this with the... the the area around it and sure and, and yeah that also it's worth noting that on average these fixtures are about two to three feet below and grade the road line so you get a little bit of grade relief that, that helps kind of offset the true you know mm -hmm. if you're standing at the street line looking at these fixtures so they're going to be they're going to be the site is down, down yeah on feet. average two to three feet between all of them so this is the open space parcel that obviously it's not going to get touched. And then the Sportsman's Club, I'm not going to speak for them, but I can't imagine they're going to come this way either because there's a, a wetland on this that has protective buffer zones. So, and then you got the skeet range, right? And then we have the, the two parcels across the way. But again, we can keep those light levels backlit or back protected so they're not going towards the frontage. Um, and we can keep those poles down lower on the frontage side uh, to, to help that as well and keep everything from spelling over on the front. So, so yeah, I think we who, can who, try who's, some. who's directly across from you? I don't know the names that we have. Uh, is it Hopkins at Lum Street Auto? Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, it's McIntyre. Mac 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 uh, yeah, okay. And Harper Brothers Realty Court. The other thing, I did know if the building lighting was also included, the exterior lighting that's yeah, mounted on the building, is that included in the plan? We do have some, yeah, at the egress point. But is that included in the photometric plan? Yes. Okay. Okay, so try to get to another hot topic. Basically, site lighting's got some homework to it, I guess. Any other comments from the public on site lighting? Uh, trying to think of what. It, oh, let's go. Let's go to sidewalks. I think we can kind of hit sidewalks tonight, uh, just because uh, we seem to be talking about that a lot tonight. Uh, but then uh, that was a waiver request, and. We'll try to get through that today because that'll give you some direction one way or the other. And I think everything else you will have, I think, enough direction or you're, you're on the right track for getting everything ready. Sidewalks. Um, basically, if you look at the plan that we're given, basically they allow access to the north side only. Putting that in the context of the, of the site, how do board members feel or public feel about? Yeah. Um, could I ask? Do you have the um, diagram that shows the different parcels in the neighborhood mixed use district? I know this is parcel seven, but show this in relation to the other parcels, like where the Hopkinton Muse is. Sure, we do. If you just give us a second. I think we used it in the conservation uh, presentation. Right, but I, I would like to see that because I do think that connectivity is an important factor and um, this is part of the neighborhood mixed use, a whole, a whole area that was permitted with the understanding that these would all you know, work together and complement each other. Um, so this isn't in isolation of the other developments. I apologize. We did have one. We seem to have lost a board somewhere in town hall. Okay. <laughs> okay. Not, but so the blue is the that this, one this is another commercial yeah. site. It's another commercial, yeah. and then the muse is over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then here. Okay. okay. So here we are. Right here, yep. Lot seven. Mm -hmm. Lot five is the open space. Uh, lot four is undeveloped and unpermitted at this time. And then obviously lot two is permitted and lot three is permitted. Mm -hmm. Those projects are well, okay. If you want my <laughs> my opinion, um, as I said, this is part of a, an entire grouping. Um, the objective is to 
you know, one of the objectives is there be some connectivity here. Um, there's a very high likelihood that people in those 280 units in the Hopkinton Muse are going to want to use the tennis and the pool club. So they're going to have to either walk down Lumber Street, which is a really dangerous proposition, or else they have to get in their cars and drive just that far down. Uh, I, I don't see any logic in extending the sidewalk um, towards the Rod and Gun Club. I, I agree with that, but I certainly think that there is a case to be made that there should be a sidewalk that connects down to the rest of the development so that anybody in that development could go to the racket club or then could maybe walk down and get a cup of coffee. Um, th there's a lot of connectivity both with the Starbucks Plaza across the street and this. Um, and, and I don't think that to expect that the town should put in that sidewalk is the town's responsibility yeah, yeah. either because there wouldn't be any reason to go down there if it wasn't for the tennis club. Um, so I think that's a total amenity for the for the new development to have the ability to walk between those other sites and your and your uh, and your facility rather than drive. I, I I kind of I'm going to agree a little bit with Claire. I think we need to get the sidewalk across lot five and lot four eventually where it'll connect up to what the Muse and the other ones are. I, I so. think the challenge will be, and we're certainly not against looking into that in more detail. Uh, we can say just from a cursory review of that, because uh, we did consider and we looked at it and we saw some of the language in the Master Plan Special Permit. One of the real big issues and real big encumbrances we're going to fall into is the edge of the wetland itself and how close in proximity it comes to the travel path of Lumber Street. And we can try to see what we have for good record in information to see how close we get to those wetlands. Uh, we did see that there's potential for relief of going with a formal sidewalk and maybe some type of meandering pathway, anything to really make that connection. And that certainly gives us a little latitude. Uh, but if that edge of the wetland comes right up to the edge of the road and you want to do a pathway, that's going to force a filling of the wetlands and replication and obviously an extensive permit with conservation. Yeah. So we can we understand. We can take a look at it. And I see mean, if, um, I, th I think somewhere we want to get there. And the town took Paul's land along West Main Street and has constructed the sidewalk. So right now he's in better shape than we were when we did the master plan special permit. So we've got the conductivity to the new new area. We now want to bring it, I think, down to Lumber Street. And I'm willing to sacrifice, I think, the, the sidewalk in front of the place, given that there's not much more to go to the south of it. I agree. Well, but we'd like to see contribution of at least equivalent amount. Sidewalk know, to the north. To, towards the, to, to the north. So you're cutting along Lumber Street there through that. I can't see it there, whatever. Yes. So this, yes. this dash line, that's the wetland limit mm -hmm. right there. Yeah. Yeah. And that was done through an ANRAD process, and there's an ORAD in place that mm -hmm. everybody agrees upon. There might be a sidewalk with a with a curb and, you know, right on the si on, on the road, too, mm -hmm. if it has to be. I mean, well, we'll look at it and see uh, before the next hearing what the feasibility okay. is and the potential impact. If I may for the chair. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I want to see a sidewalk along the whole way, and it is one big unit I like to see from Main Street, West Main Street, down all the way to the edge of this project, because I do walk that on Lumber Street. We do cleanups in town. We, uh, a lot of people live on Lumber Street, walk along it. Uh, if you're making a more of a destination for people to go to, the shops, the restaurants, uh, I think that uh, people wouldn't mind walking down or jogging down, getting a cup of coffee or juice or something, and then running back up along Lumber Street. And that's why I'm in support of uh, of the sidewalk all the way through the, the frontage. And um, I think it can happen on parcel four, like Ken's describing, along the wetland in that way, because the road's there and we'll have an edge of a road. Uh, but for this property, uh, for this project, I'm in full support of, a, of the sidewalk uh, along the whole length of it. In the front of it, too? In front of it. Well, along Lumber Street. Because there are people that live on Lumber Street that walk up and down it 
and uh, I've walked up and down it. I've done town cleanups on Green Up Day, and uh, you know what? If, if you're building a building and you're making more of a, <coughs> of a destination for people, I think more people will, will be walking it. You guys said no one walks along it. I've walked along it. Um, it's it, we're trying to make it better, and. Yeah, I would disagree with that. I, mean, I think if you connect to the, to the edge where the parking lot is, then you've got access to the facility. Do so well, they mind people it. cutting through the parking lot? I mean, mind cutting through the parking lot, but I don't think that's part of what they're yeah. saying. I think one of the things we might... Well, we have a, I'm sorry. We, we have a sidewalk from this intersection all the way into our site, all the way to the facility. Right. Right. So someone's coming walking north. Uh, would, would that be a problem from cutting through your, your parking lot? Would you have insurance issues with that? or? Uh, some's just walking, a neighbor's walking along Lumber Street, you want to have a little safety? What, what, what I think for sure we don't want to do is along the entire frontage on Lumber Street, we do not want to design a parking lot landscaping that would preclude a sidewalk going in there in the future if one decided. Mm -hmm. We have actually considered that, and the grading is in such a way that a sidewalk could be installed fairly easily. Uh, it's, it's not flat, but it works with an applicable yeah. photography. Okay, I think we're at 9 o'clock. Uh, Elaine, to continue after design review is met, because it's, we want their comments for... That would be uh, your meeting on December 7th. December 7th? What time? 7.30? Your meeting on the 7th. Our next meeting. Okay. They meet the third Tuesday. Okay. Uh, your next meeting is the 16th. That's December 7th. A design review meeting after that. That's what I'm What's December 7th? Design review or us? You. Us. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Here. So design review meets before December right. 7th. Yes. Okay. Do we have anything on December 7th? Yeah. We we'll have a public hearing at 7.30 for the Leonard Street subdivision. And that's it? Perfect. If we did, it's at 8.30 and do our best not to. Is there block. another hearing prior to that? that we, could finish it on the we wouldn't be able to finish it then. It's just, I don't think we got to. Maybe we didn't. If, if we can get through all the ends, we'd like to show what the architecture looks like. They're, they're prepared to show you that, get in, uh, input on that. What's, what's, what's our next meeting look like? On the 16th, uh, there's a hearing at 7 30 and then at 8 o'clock. The 8 o'clock one is the Haven Road project. So that's going to go to 9, least, at least. Yeah. Well, I don't think there's much to be discussed there. Okay. It was just screening. If we did 8.30 on that date? So design review will not have, have chance mm -hmm. to see anything. And, and the expectation is this will not get approved until then. We understand. We would just like to make sure that maybe we've addressed everything with, with beta, and it'd be nice to have a clean sign-off with your peer review, have that acknowledged at the next, next meeting, and then maybe any other, uh, maybe show you another pass on the lighting, and maybe discuss any of the other hot-button topics so that we make sure on the first December hearing that we've got really everything cleaned up except for a couple minor things. Okay. Well, part of our approval process is we got to have a clean set of plans, so... To, to attach to it. So, okay, why don't we do the 8.30 with the understanding that if the other one runs a few minutes long, you're going to lose a few minutes because we're going to try to get them finished one way or the other because they've been in front of us a couple of times. That's our problem. Thank you. Okay, okay so uh, look for a motion for 8.30, correct, on November 16th for a continuation. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded for the discussion. Seeing none, how do you vote? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstain? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On that. Are we going to also have to continue them again to the December 17th? Because yes. we need yes. to wait for the December Yes. Other December okay. Now we're at uh, 9 o'clock and uh, we're going to talk about trees again. Yes. Thank you. Have a good evening. Good night.
Okay. Come on down. Okay. Uh, it is nine o'clock. Tree warden here. What? There's a tree warden here. Paul's Paul's there hiding in the back. You're gonna have to really get my attention if you want to say something, Paul. Okay, but that's not necessarily my good one, Paul. The other ear. Anyway, okay. Um, like to call the uh, Scenic Road Public Hearing uh, to order. Uh, this is uh, Eversource Energy is looking to. Uh, remove some trees on Ash Front and Wilson Street and to trim major branches within several scenic road right way road right of ways. And I put together an outline for the hearing today so that we can make some progress. Uh, we have two members, myself who lives on Ash Street. This outline's been broken out so that I don't have to vote on the Ash Street stuff. And Frank's on Saddle Hill, so he won't vote on the, on the, the Saddle Hill discussions, and we'll just keep, well, we'll take, get off the board when we're, we're talking to those type of things, I guess. But roughly, so uh, basically, uh, the outline, uh, we're going to have plenty of public comment. I'm not sure we're going to get through it today, but when we ask for item four on the public interest, I'm going to try to make sure that everyone is here is is kind of heard on on those 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 <laughs> issues a little bit so that we get your comment kind of today. But then what we're planning to do is have a good discussion on pruning clearances and then a bunch of votes which will allow you to proceed maybe on a lot of different streets. And then we'll go, probably, I don't think we'll get there in, a, in an hour on the ones where we have the, 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 uh, this, the, the tree by tree. I don't know whether the members of the board, well, we'll get to that in a little bit. So, Eversource, uh, why don't you introduce yourself to the other members of the board here. Uh, yeah, my name is Chris Gonzalez. I work as the arborist, distribution arborist for approximately 45 towns um, on the, around the greater Boston area including Hopkinton. Um, uh, I've been in the job for about seven months now. You know, this is one of my first major undertakings, so I'm um, hoping it goes well. <laughs> why, why don't you kind of talk about what you want to do for pruning and what you're proposing and then kind of the <coughs> rough order on the trees? Sure. Um, basically what we're looking for is a clearance specification around the electric wires. That would be the primary wires. Uh, the primary wires would be the wires that are highest up on the poles, on the streets. Um, we're looking for a clearance of 10 feet on either side of the wires, 10 feet below, and 15 feet above those wires. And, um, you know, that clear, we also clear the secondary wire, which is on the same pole as the primary wires, but we only look for a clearance of about, you know, 18 inches to 2 feet around those wires, because the uh, voltage of electricity in those wires is quite a bit lower. Um, a lot of the scenic roads in town have not been pruned in, I would say, in excess of 10 years. Um, they are extremely overgrown at this point. We've seen a lot of trees that are actually burning on the wires. Um, the number of outages has been high, but really my main concern, besides reliability of the electric service, is safety in general. Um, we cannot have something that's flammable next to something that's got 13,500 volts of electricity flowing through it. Okay. Lane, do you have some comments for the board members on no, this? No, I think just uh, go through what's familiar with the program, the vegetation management program. Paul? Not the moment. Okay, so we'll get to you more on the, the tree by tree blow, I guess. I, I have uh, one comment. Yeah. It has been uh, pruning almost on uh, every other year uh, mm -hmm. basis. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if you maybe want to check your records. Uh, look for the trouble areas historically and stuff like that. Well, we, we have pruned probably every year on roads that are not scenic route roads. Scenic roads. Um, we have not been able to prune the scenic roads themselves, from what I understand, in about three years. Does that sound about right, Paul? About three years, I think. It, it, it varies. From yeah. I mean, Saddle Hill, I mean, where you live, actually was probably one of the last scenic roads that we were actually able to prune on. Okay. You guys did a very good job when you did it, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at this at this point, I want to get 
because there's a lot of public folks here for the meeting. I want to make sure. Why don't you say what you're interested in? We won't get into like the real details, but I want to make sure that we're going to cover it tonight and as much as we can. So, sir, if you want to say something, where, where you live and what you want to. Okay. I'm Laurie Gasser. I live on 28 South Mill Street. And my interest is the, the degree of pruning. I understand it has to happen. Uh, but, uh, you know, are we just talking about cost to, to prune less, you know, okay. more frequently? Less okay. Well, pruning on Saddle Hill. Yeah. No. Oh. South, Mill. South Mill. South Mill. South Mill. Okay. Right. South Mill. Okay. Hi, Mary Arnott. I live at 51 Teresa Road. And um, I'm here because I'm concerned about the amount of trees that they actually want to demolish on scenic roads. Okay. Mavis? Well, I would support that. Too, okay. As you know. Huh? Same here. Okay. Uh, same here. Uh, but I agree. For years, the utility of, um, uh, sorry, Wilson Street. Yep. The utility companies come along Wilson Street and trim the branches uh, in accordance with what we expect for our scenic roads. That was what, uh, I do, don't want or expect any difference this year. None of my trees should be co totally cut down. <clears throat> they have been flagged and without any notice of being on my property. Every cut down healthy tree is a loss for the town. Okay. Matt? Um, East Main Street and Wilson Street uh, with similar concerns to the other folks. Sure. <coughs> I think we know where you're your <laughs> concerned. No, we're all, Matt. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, I'm Estelle Chase. I live at 123 Ash Street. I had the opportunity to walk around with Chris. At, I had contacted him a week prior and asked him to tag the 24-inch caliper and the 36-inch um, caliper trees. And they did that. And I looked uh, together, he and I looked at each and every one of them, and um, uh, he d said that they would, instead of removing trees, they would just simply prune. And I'm very concerned, but I'm even more concerned about the next generation of trees, because they're also planning to prune or remove six-inch caliper trees, which can take up to 10 or 15 years to grow in and of themselves. There's no need to take those trees out. I'm just very concerned about our scenic roads in, in Hopkinton, considering all the development that's been going on, especially with the Legacy Farms stuff. One, 123 Ash Street? Yeah. Okay. My name is Paul Pilar from 67 um, like Front Street. Um, I'm also concerned about the size of the box. Um, and then my wife tells me, and she sort of pays attention to these things, that NSTAR gave us a notice about a year ago and, and did come and do some pruning on our front street. So I think that they have been uh, doing some pruning to try to make sure they keep it away from the water. So I'd like to have that taken into account. Hi, I'm Julia Homer on 68 Front Street, and my concerns just echo everyone's here. I, too, am concerned about the young trees and the loss of the next generation of trees and the overall look of the scenic roads, um, especially given um, what's happened over the legacy. Okay. Place. So I think we, we have a good overview of where we're, we're trying to get to. From members of the board, um, I put together this outline. Does that seem reasonable to try to uh, take this piece one, one bite at a time and, and get to the end of it uh, in a mm -hmm. kind of organized way? Mm -hmm. Okay. So basically, uh, uh, let's start with the pruning discussion because that was a lot of it, and we can certainly get through the, hopefully that discussion uh, tonight. And and uh, and we'll say that that takes care of all but three three trees. So that if you had plans on working this fall, you can get going. I guess if once we get done here. So I think you've. The request before us is 15, 10, 10, and 10, which would put, to me, such a huge box through the, the center of the street that it makes it impossible. Uh, I mean, I guess if I would say that you do have a, uh, have a bylaw that says we're not allowed to take anything over five inches in diameter uh, off of anything that's a scenic road uh, without permission. That's correct. So. You know, uh, the 10 to 10 by 15 box is generally not something that is actually achieved. I mean, it is our clearance specification, but um, we're not going to be cutting any entire trees in half. We're not going to be getting anything over five inches in diameter without permission from 
somebody within the town. Well. Yeah, but even if you're not cutting over a five inches diameter, I mean, that's a huge swath of the branches, and they may be small branches, but they together create the canopy, and, mm -hmm. you know, you're just going to have this gigantic, empty hole. Uh, just, the look will be devastating. What if, what if, what if we, and this is open for big type of discussion, what if you did something like a 5-5-5 five, five, and five on hardwood trees and maybe the pines need a little bit more above it because, but a five inch branch is not going to, going to droop too far. I don't, I don't know. You know, it's something, and I'm just throwing out numbers and, and I'm, I'm just trying to get something to get the discussion kind of going. Can, can I ask where does the 10, 10, yeah. 10, 15 come from? What's That's the growth rate you're trying to accommodate? Yeah, well, um, actually we, there are OSHA regulations say that we are not allowed to get within two and a half feet of mm -hmm. the wires, period, you know, of the voltage that we're pruning around, though, which would be about 13 and a half thousand volts. Uh, added that about two and a half feet for sway of the wires and the trees themselves when it's windy and then our circuits are on a four-year cycle so meaning every tree every tree should be pruned once every four years and so taking into account growth rates of the typical trees in this area that's where we get that extra five feet and the 15 feet above that's just somewhat arbitrary to be honest but the four-year cycle is an operational cycle that you guys... Consider. Yeah, it's, it's generally an industry standard, yeah, for this part, part of the country, okay. considering tree growth rates. Well, I think that's got the biggest impact, mm -hmm. and it sounded to me like you were talking about maybe four to, four to six feet in that range mm -hmm. when I kind of added it all up. And, Five-inch branch doesn't sway as much, I guess. I don't know. I, I either five or six feet. I in the, in that range. Paul, what do you? Well, right now down um, around the lake, we have crews working there now. We're in on scenic roads. They're purring to the 10, 10, 15 spec. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it would do well for you to get out and take a look and see what it actually looks like. Mm -hmm. and I think you will find that it's not as drastic as you're thinking it may be. I know it sounds, yeah. it sounds, you know, it sounds tough, mm -hmm. but when you actually see it applied, um, it doesn't come off looking as bad. Excuse but, as I say, please, you know, by all means, go look. Just one more time for clarification. Go ahead. To the chair. Where yeah. is this? Uh, Lake Massbach. Um, uh, Yale, uh, Amherst, uh, Yale, Amherst. Okay. Okay. Off, off of Lakeshore. Lakeshore, all of that area is being done at present. I'll go tomorrow. Can I ask where they get permission to do all that from? Look, it's not a scenic road. So we are uh, required by law to submit a plan to the to individual towns at the beginning of the year. Um, it goes to the tree warden, and I'm not sure who else, who else looks at it in the town, but um, you know, the town has 90 days to approve or disapprove the. Uh, uh, the plan that we were given to them. Did you get a response? Yes, we did. And they approved it? Yes. I did. Let me also point out, uh, if I may, that they are required under uh, the mandate of the Department of Public Utilities to maintain their system. Um, they are required to do this program. It just seems a little drastic. I mean, these are similar clearance specifications that we're getting in a number of other towns. Um, you know, I do think that some of the streets that we are sp speaking about um, are going to be impacted heavily just because the trees have not been pruned in so long, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons why I've requested to remove some of these small trees because I feel that um, even if we are getting a minimal clearance, like what Ken was suggesting, like a five feet, five feet you know, around the side of these wires, you know, these trees are going to be essentially topped, you know, unfortunately but it's been that long since they've been pruned. You know, what we generally try and do is maintain the tr trees so that they uh, grow around the wires instead of grow back into the wires. It's called directional pruning or natural pruning. Um, you know, and things tend to look better that way. Uh, but I think that a lot of these smaller trees will be impacted heavily by our pruning, unfortunately. Yeah. So when you say pruning, does that mean they're going to be removed or is that just they're going to mean to be cut back? No, they, they cannot remove them. Okay. Yeah, we can't so remove anything without without permission. Okay. 
it would basically be pruning them away from our electric wires. But the, the, is there any kind of, uh, ex from experience, that this amount of severe pruning is actually going to damage the tree and then it may end up dying anyway? It, it just seems very drastic in terms of how much you want to cut back. Oh, I understand. You know, well, once again, you know, these are trees that have not been pruned in over 10 years in some cases. And we'd like you said, we'd like to maintain them every four years. We just have not been able to, um, you know, get permission to do so. Well, why you know, haven't you been able to get permission to do so? If, you, if your routine is that in most communities mm -hmm. you normally do it every four years, why are you now coming 10 years down the road? and saying, well, we haven't been able to get permission. Why haven't we been able to get permission? Well, a lot of these roads have been scheduled to be pruned within the last few years. Uh, okay. But, uh, but we're, my predecessor, I don't know, it was his job to do it, and he, unfortunately, we were not able to come to an agreement. Mr. Chairman, again, go ahead. we just have a good example. We just went through one of the worst winters in a long, long time. Um, what was the impact in terms of service in the town of Hoppington to the people that receive service through your company well, I think based they, on down trees. But I know on Wilson Street, we, we didn't really lose power at all. It was great. So mm -hmm. just curious what the, was the impact of not having maintained these trees in terms of the level of service after the storms? Well, the, this, per, this previous winter, I mean, we had an incredible amount of snow, but the weather, the temperatures themselves were so low that the snow was not heavy. You know, um, I would have to think back to the October storms, the Halloween storms we had a few years ago when we actually had leaves in the trees and we had a, a heavy wet snow, that's when we saw a huge impact on the system in general, including Hopkinton. And Wilson Street has been pruned within the last two or three years, not ten years. Well, I don't, is, if I'm, am I incorrect to say that not all, is all of Wilson Street actually a, a scenic road? Yeah. The entire yeah. thing? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, there's been a lot of work done on Wilson Street yes. uh, by the gas can tank area because they put some new lines in, so, so I'm sure would, somebody... Uh, Wilson Street be included when he's taking down these big trees that the ribbons on? Yeah, Paul? Okay. Well, Wilson Street has not been proved as Mr. Gonzalez is suggesting. There may have been some limbs that were broken and on wires that were removed, but as far as a systematic pruning that he's speaking of, it has not been done on Wilson Street in at least seven years. It's the level of pruning you're talking yeah, about as opposed to the... Right. Well, I think, I think the 10, 10, 10 has gotten bigger in the last couple of years, too. Yes. Yeah. So is the um, amount of pruning you're recommending, is that to allow for the anticipated four years' worth of growth and then expecting that you'll come back in the required four? Or is that to allow for maybe 10 because last time it didn't get done in 10? What, how, mono, how much growth is that supposed to be allowing for? How many years' worth? That's, that's supposed to be allowing for four years' growth. I mean, we, we okay, anticipate so that we will be back pruning these trees once every four mm -hmm. years. The, the big difference is once you've done it this time, the amount of growth that you will get in four years will be about the diameter of my thumb. So the next time through will be a lot Small. less impact. Okay. That seems like personally, again, a reason, especially with the scenic roads, a reason not to have this big, huge tunnel of space around the wires. We're trying to, we're trying to create, maintain what areas of the town we can in terms of the overall character and scenic roads obviously have a huge role in that and just relative to what I know you're going to talk about removal of trees separately but in terms of the pruning especially on the scenic roads it seems real drastic to be that amount. Well to use it, I'm sorry. Yeah, right? Go ahead. Um, Clinton Street was just recently done from um, from Front Street to um, I think it was the Ashland line, and it was done to that 10, 10, 15 spec, and that is about as heavily treed as Ash Street, Saddle Hill Road. So uh, once again, I would suggest you go and look, see what the impact actually was as opposed to what you're envisioning, and you know, make a decision from there. I have a document here from NSTAR that says electric distribution vegetation management standards. And on the next to last page, it says uh, extenuating circumstances may dictate that lesser clearances be accepted. And they show 8, 8, 12 instead of 10, 10, 15 as an example. So that one, that one's an 8, 8, 8, 12? 
Article you said 8812. 8, 8, so I'm wondering what are the extenuating circumstances and wouldn't a scenic road qualify? Yeah, I, you know, if I can be completely honest, I, I have no problem coming to some agreement on a, on a mm -hmm. smaller clearance okay. specification. You know, if we wanted to go back to 8812, that'd be absolutely fine. You know, I think that would be adequate, more than adequate. So what would be the least that would be a safe for, for the, the guys that have got to go up and trim the lens and the guys that have got, got to go up and service the lines, what would be the minimum requirement to still adhere to the safety requirements for these people to operate? Um, go, if we were go with the smallest box first and then work up. Well, like, <laughs> like I said, uh, if we were to prove right now, and two and a half feet is the OSHA minimum requirement. But, okay. once again, two and a half feet is, is not adequate at all. Um, you know, okay. for regrowth and, uh, you know, guys working around the wires in general, it's just it's not safe. Right. Um, you know, we, we do have agreements with other towns, like 8812. Um, you know, and if we want to look at individual trees, I, I certainly can do that. Are there any okay. towns that you have small, lower box requirements than the, what you just mentioned? The 8812 is the smallest one we have. I think, uh, like Newton, you know, like Cambridge. I don't understand if the OSHA requirements say that two and a half feet is the minimum. Why are your specifications not in line with OSHA? Well, uh, you get electrocuted. Well, uh, you know, the the. OSHA requirements are for somebody who is trained around working. Is, is EHAP certified? EHAP is Electrical Hazard Awareness and Protection Program. Um, now, in order to work within two and a half feet of those electrical wires, you need to be EHAP certified. Um, so your people company doesn't have anybody that's... Everybody is EHAP certified. certified. Yes, I, I think you're, you're missing... You're, you guys are missing each other's the point. Annual. The person doing the work cannot get any closer than two and a half feet to that 13,000 volt line. That's his yeah. safety yes. distance yeah. that he has to stay. He has to stay away, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. That's how he's got to stay away. So what we're talking about here is creating the box, as it's been phrased, but he's he's got to do what he's doing at that two foot, you know, two foot four inches for 13,000 volts. He's got to get his bucket in there to, to cut the lens. Yeah. Well, I don't want to be anything in harm's way, but it just seems to me that there could be a smaller box if you want to call it the box. Yeah, so, I mean, because it's, these are important it's, trees. It's, it's, all trees yeah, are important. Yeah. They create air for us to breathe. With all the development that's going on, we want to save as many trees as we can. Right. So. Sure, but there's also a standard that we operate you, under you that yeah. says that you can usually get the clearance you need with three cuts. And that doesn't mean taking you know, limbs this big well, around. I think there's a, I think from a practical standpoint, there's more of a box area needed around each pole as opposed to when the line is in the middle. I mean, the probability of somebody working on the line in the middle and being anywhere close to it is much more slimmer than mm -hmm. closer to the pole. Than closer to the pole. I mean, yeah. uh, I don't I don't know yeah. if that's necessarily no? true. No, you know, one of the one I, of the one I've of never the seen the guys working on anything other than the poles myself. Well, in storm conditions, you know, the guys can be working, could be anywhere. I mean, when we have trees down during the middle of a storm, a lot of times the guys are working in the middle of the night. Um, you know, it would be hard-pressed for me to send somebody out on a, something like Ash Street in the middle of the night, you know, when the thing is, the wires are actually, you know, buried in the middle of these trees. Um, you know, have somebody do that safely. That would be the kind of thing I'd only want to send somebody out there during the day to do, just because it's that dangerous. From what I'm hearing from what Chris is saying, you got your two and a half feet, which is the safety zone for the worker, because you don't want him to get killed up there. Right. Then he needs another two and a half feet of area just to be able to work in. So you've got five feet that, that you well, know, the you other, the other two and a half feet that we have is for the, uh, the sway, taking into account the sway yeah. of the lines. And then, the and then if they're only going to, hopefully, you know, doing this every four years, it, I mean, trees do grow. You have to allow some space for growth. So if we were to set something that's right up to the minimum, you know, in no time at all, those trees are going to be grown in and we're going to be right back where we were. Um, you know, I, I think there's a happy medium here. Um, and maybe it's that 8812, but the whole idea is that they don't, they can't come back and do this every year. You need to have accommodation for some kind of some kind of tree growth. Yeah, yeah. The other question I have is, 
I'm not sure all these lines are 13,000 volts. I mean, I, I doubt the South Mill Street line. Yeah, they are. If, you, if you've seen them, one of the, the little clusters, they're yeah, all 13. It's only a single wire. And oh. I'm at the very end of the end of that line. Oh, well, line. Then, then you're on a it's secondary line. It's not 13,000 volts. No, I understand what you're saying, you know, and uh, in probably in the entire system, not everything is 13,500 volts at one time, but there's potential for it to be that high. And so we have to, we have to, con we have to consider it to be that, that that's voltage. If, if, if they don't know it's an emergency, <coughs> better to be safe than sorry. That's most, most of, most of Hopkins is 13.8, where, where, you, where you're seeing the, the three phases the three. And, and the grounder with the, with the little triangle space. Uh -huh. yeah. Right, but they they, they did all that about 25, 30 years ago, and they and they raised the pole up about four or five feet and, and took a big box out when they were doing all that work, and it took a while to get it back to looking normal. Question for the yeah. chair. Um, how, how does the process work if we want to talk about having a smaller box, 8812? Is that a motion that we make or we ask the appellant to we, we, at, the, at the point we could make a motion of whatever size we end up deciding to to do from from a an area i also note that this really covers i believe five inch limbs which end up being i'll say stiffer so you know they can they can trim smaller limbs yeah, that may be many of these circuits that are not within your jurisdiction. They may not be large branches. They may just be small branches, yep. and they wouldn't need your approval. Yep. Um, well, I'd like to make the motion that... Are we at that point? Oh, when we're at that point. Well, uh, uh, let's, let's have discussion. What, Frank, are you proposing at this point? Uh, well, since the appellant seems to be open to a smaller box, uh, and since we have uh, neighbors uh, here that are interested in uh, more of a conservative approach toward the trees, uh, as the same view I have, uh, I think it's uh, enough of a window for safety, and uh, for a four-year plan, I think it could work. Um, because I think it kind of matches what I've seen in my experience in town. Um, I know we've had... What, what are you proposing? So I'm, I'm proposing that we look at the 8A12 and, and that's 12 above? Yeah. Okay. And, and eight, 8 below, 8 on each side? Yes. Yeah. 10 below, 8 below, 10 So you're 20 feet eight by eight 16 eight. feet. Um, so, 8 feet below the wires. Mm. So eight feet. So you have a small tree growing below the wires. You prune that tree. You might as well just cut it down. I mean, that's what that's that's the right. whole point of that's, me asking for a lot of these trees to yeah. be removed. So it's because, not really. Uh, you know, they're not really going to be pruning them. They're going to be cutting them down. Uh, well, they can't. We can't be topping. Them. They'll so be topping them. So then essentially, it's eight eight. It's so nothing then below. We'll get. No, no, that's not, not true at all. I mean, if there is any, actually, if there is anything for us to move to a lateral, proper lateral, to, for us to cut back to, that will encourage the tree to grow around the wires instead of back into the wires, that's absolutely what we want to do. You know, we certainly don't want to kill trees. That's, you know, that's the last thing we want to do. But, um, you know, I feel like in, in the trees that I have on this list, I think are going to be impacted in that way, that eventually they could die. Are these all, all the trees on the list, are they all sort of, equally dangerous or do you have some kind of prioritization that you did? You know, that these third of the trees are really, um, it's most essential that these be pruned and then there's a second tier. Was there any kind of prioritization or are these all equally dangerous trees? Well, once again, a lot of the trees that are between an inch and a half and six inches in diameter aren't necessarily dangerous. You know, we can prune those successfully, you know, out of our wires and, you know, every source will get what they want, which is protection of the wires and and making sure that the, the safety hazard is, is uh, nullified. Um, any of the bigger trees, you know, my foresters were the ones who identified a lot of these, and some of the trees, they identified them because they were within that two feet, five inches, two feet, six inches required by OSHA. You know, it could be a <coughs> tree could be completely healthy, but if, it, if it's within that zone, that is something that we're asking to take down. Is it, is it possible to, to 
to do a further analysis of Absolutely. Trees, which streets? Yeah, because it is quite revealing when you do see which trees. Um, so uh, I think that, in my opinion, I think that all of the trees should be tagged, all of them, because it comes out to 240 trees on Ash Street. Mm -hmm. 240 trees. Mm -hmm. 112 trees on Wilson Street, 73 trees on Front Street, for a total of 425 trees that you have just on this list. Mm -hmm. And that's not including, you know, trees that might get hacked and pruned along the way. So this is a major impact. So uh, you and I went and looked at some of these trees that you had tagged for us, and some of them you even said were questionable whether, why, why were these tagged? They're perfectly fine. Some of them maybe had splits in, could be cabled, braced. I mean, are there... Can well, we cabling and bracing here? is not something that we're willing to do because it's generally, it's not, it's not really yeah. safe. It's something you can do to your to yeah. an ornamental tree in your yard, but, yeah. you know, that's not something that I would trust to have around the electric lines, lines. especially since, you know, the cable itself is metal and <coughs> metal would come in contact with the wires and could electrify the entire tree. Okay, but anyway, could a further review before taking down a 36-inch caliper, 75-year-old tree be done on all the streets like you did on Ash Street? Yeah, I have absolutely no problem doing that. I mean, if we want to set up a group, I don't, I don't, if you had any other ways, you could you suggest that we do that as well. You know, more than willing to take a look at these trees. Why don't, why don't we, people. It, it sounds to me like we're, we're not going to be ready for a vote tonight. It just doesn't sound like we're getting there because I'm hearing a lot more requests for information type of stuff. Uh, but I had concerns because when I tried to look for a lot of the trees, and, and I went up and down Ash Street with, with Chris, and, you know, there's some that there's no way in hell would I want to go let go. And I tried to look for them on Wilson Street. I saw most of them kind of over there, but the blue tags are a little bit smaller than what they should be on Rafferty we have at least you know the notice on, on them and I think we need to put the notices on them because quite frankly I well I'm very pleased we have the nice turnout we got I don't think we got a lot of turnout because nobody really realized what what is going on and uh, but maybe but maybe people do I don't know it's uh, so I think that Number one, I think we need the notices on on the on the trees, just so we know where it's at. And I, I'm willing to, I'll say, go for some long walks. My cardiologist says that's a good idea too. Uh, and you know, we schedule some, and we just, you know, maybe we put a car at one end and and, and, and drive drive enough people back and forth, and just take take a, a couple walks on Saturday. To your point, Ken. Uh, Front Street on this, this is the list of ones Elaine put together that are supposed to actually be taken down. And there's supposed to be four trees on Front Street that are anywhere between the 12 inch and the 24 inch diameter. Those are big trees. There's supposed to be four of them. I drove Front Street four times tonight. And I could not, and it's not hard to miss a 12 inch tree. I could not find a 12 inch tree or bigger with the blue tag. So I don't know where they are. I mean, I'm less concerned about the one and a half inch ones, but. They're not. They're not tagged. So I'd like to have another pass of just with some yeah, tags. So, uh, the trees in front of my house there aren't eleven trees. There's only five. Mm -hmm. So it's marked as eleven. Yeah. They, I know at one point some of these trees were looked at back in like April. You know, and I know that they all were flagged at one point. And uh, you know, some of the stuff on Front Street I think was just in the, done maybe a month or two ago. And I looked at all. It was all flagged at one point. Unfortunately, the flagging that we use doesn't always persist on the tree trunks themselves. I mean, it's biodegradable. We want to do that on purpose. Squirrels tend to like it for their nests, so uh, it tends to disappear. Uh, it, so once again, if there's a, if there's a better way of fla of marking these trees so that everybody is aware of exactly what we want to have taken down, no I'm paint. Certainly open to suggestions. No, we don't want to paint anything. Orange is much easier to see even than the blue. Well, it's uh, true, but the blue will. We want a ribbon, a more. but within each cluster, we want to see the notice so everyone understands it. Mm, that's right. Or all bigger trees for sure have yeah, the notice. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the. If there's a whole cluster of a little one and they all have ribbons, I think one piece of paper can can, can probably do it. But, you know, it uh, should be easy to see. 
uh, in it. You know, I, I, I'm willing to, to, to walk it if we wanted to set up the time, if yeah. anyone wanted to do it. But if, mm -hmm. on the other hand, if they're such that one can see them, then maybe we don't have to do a group walk. But, or, and, I, and the other thing is, everyone that's here, you can put your comments in email or, or write them down, in particularly if you have a tree at this address that you say, hey, wait a second, no way in hell, please, you know, spare the spare the trees. Then, yeah, Matt? Just want to follow up on your idea of getting out for a site visit. I would also, I think a lot of us from many of the different streets, if you did have them, I think we'd be happy to join you because I know we'd like I had a good visit with one of the representatives or one of your foresters that came out on our particular property on Wilson Street, and it was good to, you know, there were some that I said, okay, this is okay, to, it makes sense to actually cut down mm -hmm. because it was mm -hmm. uh, going to impact safety and things. And it, I think if we have that type of input, it can come to a good balanced approach to this, and all parties can win. So. And one, one, one part this board has seen in the past bunch of years, if it is a couple of trees, and I'll say the forest is right behind it. Uh, I remember a couple of ones we did over on the west side of town. We basically said, yeah, maybe it made more sense to, to you know, to, to take them down at that point. If if it wasn't going to completely gut the, the view, uh, view shed of, of going down the street. And, uh, to the chair? Yeah. Um, Question to the appellant: If um, if we do lower the box to eight to eight eight twelve, uh, will that affect the tree removal plan, or are any of these trees uh, that would come off the list? And second part of the question is: On Ash Tree, we did remove a bunch of trees for sidewalks. Uh, are there any duplicate trees that are maybe? I, I think there are some. Addressed here. I, th I, I think there were some. I think there were some more that were that were marked that I saw that were actually off the uh, off the sidewalk though as well. Yeah, yeah, there are still some right along the new sidewalk that are marked down almost near uh, you know, well, the farthest the sidewalk goes down. I'm trying to remember the street. When you, I had a question regarding yeah. the cutting of the trees. When you, typically when you cut these trees and they're in the town right of way, what happens to the commercial value of the tree? Does the town gets paid for the value of the tree? No. Um, uh, so what happens with the value of the tree? Uh, the, we do not assess value of the tree. I mean, uh -huh. it's not something that we, we've ever done. No, but you cut it down. Mm -hmm. Explain to me what happens afterwards. The wood. Well, oh, the, the wood itself? You cut, you well, cut, yeah. well yeah. Hey, I'll answer the question because okay. my neighbor had two dead ones. That obviously Paul and, and Paul has the authority of all the dead trees. We're we're only in live ones, right. and ones right. that are almost dead maybe. But but my neighbor had two, and the NSTAR had a crane crew going up and down Ash Street, and uh, they dropped those two with a single cut, and put basically eight to ten inches right into the chipper. I mean, yeah. it was the most efficient removal of two trees I've ever seen in my <laughs> life because they, they literally dropped them in the road. Police weren't there. But before anyone could call, call the cops, they had, had them into the chipper and gone. I mean, it was, it was an unbelievable uh, uh, process. They're, they're a good crew. Yeah. If they're you fast. had a 24-inch tree, mm -hmm. say, and it's an oak, for example, uh, and you've got a 16-foot run of the trunk that's pretty straight and no relatively few defects, it's got commercial value, mm -hmm. so whoever's cutting it down is hired by the town to cut it down or by your utility mm -hmm. service, right, to cut it down. What happens to the value of the tree? Doesn't it belong to the, t the town? It, it, that's never, never a topic that's actually come up before. Um, generally, the trees that we're marking do not have that much good wood in them. I mean, these trees that we're taking down, I would say for the vast majority of them are have some serious defects or dead, mm -hmm. um, you know, have, have cankers on them, but what, any splits, you know, yeah. generally the, the wood is not commercially viable afterward. Um, a lot of people do ask to save the wood if we do take right. trees down off of private property. Um, a lot of people do ask to save, you know, actually on our permission right. form that we have, we actually have an option where it says fall wood or leave wood. Right. You know, if the homeowner wants us to leave the wood, that's exactly what we'll do. You know, it's right. generally more of a burden for our tree crews to take the haul the wood away than it is just to, to leave it. 
So, um, you know, if anybody wants extra wood, then you know, be more than happy to get rid of it. The reason, one of the reasons I ask is because we've got those oaks up by Wilson and, and Rafferty, mm -hmm. and at least one of them sound. You did say that they're both a little, they're on the decline. But there's, there's timber in there, right, that has value. Uh, the only value would be firewood. Right. So you would just dispose of it? That's it just right. It's cut down and get disposed of it. Because it's, it's more work for, for when, when I hire subcontractors to right. do it, it's more work for us to try and, well, let me put it this way, the least amount of times I handle it, cheaper it is for the town. Gotcha. So if it goes onto a truck and goes to a, a dump site where it gets turned into a giant pile of wood chips, mm. You know, I'm not paying for that. I paid for the tree removal, and that's where your tax dollar went. Gotcha. And as, as Chris pointed out, the trees that we're taking down are dead, dying, diseased. They're damaged in some form or fashion. We're not taking down a perfectly healthy tree. Okay. In, you know, in general. Right. Okay. okay. I was so just curious. What no, that's fine. Through the chair, if I could, if I could, I've had some trees taken down that. Um, I got a lower price for taking them down because they did have value, and then they were taken to the lumber mill. So, um, when your tree cutters are making bids, or you just hire them, or do they bid per project, or are they, are they like on, on call? Well, I cutters? think we're getting a little bit off. The answer is clear. We are off my, my first question though, the 8A12 box. Mm -hmm. Does that reduce any, any of the trees that might be taken yeah. down, uh, removed? Well, I, I think at this point, you know. Um, you know, the, the trees that we want to have removed, you know, it seems like everybody's at consensus that we want to take another look at these. You know, and mm -hmm. one of my suggestions to Estelle was that we actually do the pruning first and see what some of these trees look like afterward. Mm -hmm. And then we can decide whether or not we feel like, you know, with, and everybody takes a look at them, you know, we feel they need to come down, then we can do that. Not to be nitpicking, <laughs> and this might sound like a trivial question, but mm -hmm. pr there's pruning and then there's pruning. Mm -hmm. And there's good pruning and there's bad pruning. So, would you could you explain to me the qualifications of the people who are going to do the pruning of any of these major trees? Yeah, the uh, the tree company that um, has a contract for this particular area is called Tree Tech. Um, they are probably one of the better companies that we work with, in my opinion. And so I was actually glad that they are the people that will be working in Hopkinton, just because you know I trust the guys. You know, they do quite a bit of residential work. Do so they? I find, you know, uh, you know the, the, so the cuts and the, the, fine, the end result, from my opinion, I think is, is good. You know, but I think there's still going to be the issue of, you know, how much is being removed from the tree itself. You know, regardless of how good a arboriculturally arbor perfect cut it is, if you're taking a lot out of the tree, you know, you know I can see people are still going to have a... Have an, okay, but it'll be, be done it. properly according to industry standards of yes. pruning, yep. proper pruning, because I've seen hack jobs and then I've seen... Yeah, on that subject, there was a ANSI standard A300 mm -hmm. for uh, American standard for tree care operations. Are they going to be going by those that standard? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Standard. All right. I, I think that's a reasonable standard. I looked at what it said. It, it seems to try to preserve the tree, not just cut holes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Mr. Okay. Chair, I would maybe like to retract my... Motion. Yeah, I didn't. I don't remember hasn't, getting a second. Hasn't been seconded. <laughs> so. Well, I, I was waiting for it. I'm about to retract yeah. that motion. Okay. Or it's not seconded. Okay. And um, it seems like perhaps um, what I'm hearing that there might be a better way of going, which would be pruning and coming back and looking at this later, as far as tree removal. And uh, the motion I'd like to make would be to. Uh, that we approve this uh, process with the 8A12 box and come back and look at what trees need to be removed after the pruning is, is accomplished. Kind of you, can, you can make the motion. I, I kind of want to go look at Lakeshore and Clinton mm -hmm. before I get <coughs> too excited about the, mm -hmm. the area. Well, I'm just, I'm just talking yeah. just the pruning yeah. side, so they they can do that before well, the winter gets. Well, I'm I'm not I'm not hearing consensus yet, personally. Sure, I'm I mean, out there. I mean, but if somebody seconded your motion, then we we would would take up some discussion on it. No, let's go look first. <laughs> I I think let's go look, and maybe we do a site walk. 
on one of the one of the trees streets. Which which one do, are you most interested in trying to do first of the three scenic roads for removal? Um, which C three scenic roads are you suggesting? I think that there were no. I'm talking about the removal ones. Oh, the removals. Oh, um, I would say Ash Street. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we may as well get the toughest one out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. Could well, I ask at least those large trees on Front Street be re-flagged? Because oh, we're going to we're going to require them all to be re-flagged. Yeah, yeah. they're, they're you know, so yeah. they're not like eighteen inches just yeah. to look. And and maybe Paul, on all the bigger trees, can you give a health or, or quality of the tree type of sure. plus? You know, I don't know how you want to grade it, but you know, hey, this one. This one's like you, you know, it's in cardiac arrest and, and it's coming down pretty quick and uh, you might as well, you know, or, you know, it's got th three limbs are broken and yeah. needs the orthopedic surgeon type of thing. Or, so, I don't know, you know. Well, especially I'll, give you, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a recommendation. A, yeah, a, re a, plus a recommendation as to just which, you know, which ones are truly bad and which ones Which are ones can ma maybe be done with some selective pruning? Because yeah. if, if you've got... If, if you're two and a half feet away and you've got a 12 inch or 18 inch going up that high up in the thing, it's not going to sway as much at, at the point of the wire. The top is still going back and forth, but... Uh, well, now it, that the leaves are down, it's hard to tell which is dead and which is alive, so all the more important to get a well, that's, health he, assessment. He can tell, I think. That, that's why I'm saying. I can't. good weather, I, you could have told, but now we need... I have a hard time sometimes Paul. without the leaves to tell which is an oak and which is needed. a maple. <laughs> point, of clarif yeah. point of clarification, um, the comments on the Eversource tree removal control form are from Eversource, but I'm assuming that you've reviewed them, I, and I, I think these comments answer kind of the question I just was asked uh, about what is the status of each of the trees. Um, they seem to be kind of descriptive, not too much in depth, but I mean... Well, let's put, put it on those forms, because then you don't have to create the form. I mean, we can handwrite it and Elaine can reproduce it for everyone and or something like that. So we have more information, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then members can also, uh, Elaine maybe will set up something for a Saturday morning, would, would Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon work for, I'll say, Ash Street and we'll meet at Center School and go for a walk and we'll put one car down at the other end and, and what are you going to do with the other streets? Let's, we'll pick out another Saturday for each one of them in a row. And whoever members want to come, I mean, there will not be any votes taken during that. This is a purely a site walk information. We'll keep chatting about it and understanding things. Now, if any of the public wants to participate. And more than welcome to come. How will we know, though, when you're going and what street? Let's, Where will that be posted? We can post it. We can post it? Yeah, we'll we'll post it. Where? At the, uh, the town website on the meeting calendar. On the meeting yeah. calendar. Okay, thank you. And uh, I think everyone knows how to get to that, mm -hmm. uh, and we will we will post it. And but please, if you've got particular ones that you know and care an awful lot, and you've got ideas on it, get that written in a piece of paper for Lane, and she's really good about getting it to everyone's meeting packet for it. And. Yeah, Matt. Thanks for giving us more about maybe a tree or trees that are now gone, but there was some, some apparent scenic road tree violations maybe on Wilson Street back in the spring. Yep. Was that ever resolved in the responsible party? I'm just trying to understand so we can. Right. It was either Verizon or Eversource, and neither one. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was something that was that was brought to my attention. You know, and when I investigated it, I I could not find. I know none of the tree crews that are under my control did it. Um, as far as that work went, you know, my I really don't know who would have cut the tree down. Um, the the poles themselves in Hopkinton are actually owned by Verizon, so any pole work that is done, you know, would be done by Verizon or a Verizon contractor. You know, I, I wasn't able to figure out who did it. I, but every, everybody that I spoke to within Eversource, you know, told me that nobody was near there. So we have no two, resource. So just two and every and everybody I spoke to in Verizon said that Eversource did it. <laughs> Who in the town is the responsible for like uh, monitoring scenic roads to see if violations take place? Because if not, if there is no 
staff person or things. That's something maybe we should think about <coughs> for the future and make sure we have resources to monitor those. And then well. secondly, I think in the scenic road bylaw there's uh, fines for violations. Yeah. Yeah. So if we need to collect some money from somebody somewhere so we have some money to help offset the trees that were, it sounds like they were improperly we, or illegally cut off. Matt, we've fined several folks in, in the past for cutting down trees on scenic roads. And it's since you find Eversource, but then Eversource said they didn't do it. Yeah, yeah. So and, I mean, I'm hoping I mean, a successful resolution you, in this, because otherwise we're talking to one of the potential parties about sure, pruning and we're, cutting we're, trees. And we're, we're looking for somebody to rat it out is probably <laughs> is the, is the best way. I mean, you know, the planning board members, one of the reasons we put scenic road signs on top of all the scenic roads at the intersections is to kind of remind people that that's where they're at. And, you know, and if people see people cutting trees down on a scenic road, you know, Elaine's the first one I call. And then she usually goes right out there. And, and just a, a last second time, Mr. Chairman, because I think it will help with citizenry mm -hmm. monitoring, because I know staff is short. Uh, when people move into uh, onto a scenic road as a new homeowner, I'm hoping if it's I not I send everyone a letter. Yep. Yeah, she, 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 yep. I monitor the sales and I send every new person a letter. <laughs> yep. Thank yep. you for volunteering that. You are now our new agent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So just, yeah. you know, I mean, it's all, it, everyone is always very concerned about the large trees that are slated to come down, but it's the total number of trees. That, it's really bugging me a lot. Um, you know, I, I've requested this. I know it would be very labor intensive, but look, you'd have to mark these trees for your crews to cut them down. Can we mark all the trees, even if it's only a six inch caliper tree? Because a six inch caliper tree, think about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, like I think that. that's, that's, that's yeah, a we've 10 all, or 15 yeah. year old tree. That's an important tree. Yep. So, you know. All the big trees, we all know that we love them and we don't want them to come down. Put the notice and, and, and we'll put a key to maybe the, the spreadsheets so that we can figure out which one so that it makes it real easy to, you know, it's either in front of somebody's house, which you kind of get it. The, the pole locations, if you're driving in your car, are very hard to find. If I was walking the street, I could understand it. I, I was having a hard time on Wilson Street today figuring out exact. A lot of them were marked. Yeah. Uh, and, and partly because I went out with you one one day on Ash Street, so I kind of understood the system a little bit better. But uh, it was it was a little more difficult than I was kind of. Yeah, I, I mean, I try and you know with the yeah. with what I submitted to the town, you know, I try and be as specific as possible. You know, I did put the the house address and the poll address. You know, just yep, to try and do as best as I could. But it's it, it is difficult. Some of might have gone down, sometimes. but but you know, Paul, you've got a notice type form that you put on trees that mm. are coming down. Anything yep. over three inches doesn't have to be. It doesn't have doesn't to be. Doesn't need permission of the planning board. It's considered good. brush. Yep. <coughs> Ken, can I ask yep. one more question? Sure. Which may be relevant when people are walking through. So you've got three dimensions, and one of them's bigger. Is that above the wire? Mm -hmm. So I get the lateral tolerance. You've got safety and sway and growth. Why is it highest above? Because that's where people are most concerned about the canopy vanishing. So why, why is that? Um, because that's where we get the limbs that break and fall on the wires. Those are the ones that actually call the, cause the outages. And the other thing is is that our, uh, our tree crews are not allowed to um, manipulate the bucket between any of the yellow wires that are on the poles. And so in order to prune on the back side of those the trees, they actually have to be able to go up and around the wires to get those. Okay, I think we want to continue the public hearing until, Elaine, when do we have our next hour? Uh, December 7th, or, well, probably November, <coughs> two weeks, probably too soon. Well, uh, if we want to allow for time, a couple of Saturdays. Yeah. Well, I, I think if we did an hour, we'll get, we'll finalize the pruning clearance discussion after we've all looked at a couple of things. And we'll be able to get at least one more street done in an hour. So if you got an hour, in, you there isn't an hour on November sixteenth anymore. Continue to one to eight thirty. What? You continue to have one of the hearings tonight yeah. till eight thirty, and so that's they need an hour. So what's our next date? So that would be December seventh at eight thirty. December seventh at eight thirty. Mm -hmm.
Okay, so we will try to do all of the list, and maybe if we do walks, we'll have maybe we'll be more efficient. But if we take if we take a minute per 400 trees, we're in trouble. <laughs> I'm just thinking of the process. I mean, but but maybe we'll be able to group group a little bit better. Can I ask one quick, quick, oh, quick sure, go ahead. Does this mean that Verizon also comes around and makes requests to prune and um, cut trees separately? No. You guys don't we, they, they, they let the, the telephone lines go right through the trees. Yeah, yeah there's no electricity going through the ten of telephone cable wire, so there's really no electrical hazard there. I mean, so, like I said, one of the reasons we prune oh. is because we don't okay. want people to get hurt. Just curious that. So if you lose your cable, to a tree branch, they don't care. I'm just curious as why Verizon would be cutting <coughs> yeah. down trees then. Well, oh, because because the they, 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 they put a new pole. They were putting it. Inflation poles all down Wilson. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're looking for a motion to continue the public hearing to December 7th at 8.30. So moved. Moved. Do I hear a second? Second. second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? Motion carried. Okay, there's one more thing for the board to discuss. There is a tree hearing, I believe, with the selectmen tomorrow night, Paul? Yes. What time? Uh, I've been told 7, <coughs> 7 and 7.30, so I'm going to be there at 7. Okay. Um, this has to do with the, the trees on Rafferty Road. Okay. Uh, we suggest that we draft a letter tomorrow for the selectmen explaining the rationale on the <coughs> sidewalk and the necessity for trees coming down on Rafferty Road. Okay. Elaine will put it together and I'll review it and sign it. Is that okay? Absolutely. Do, do we need a vote for that? Or just a it's general a discussion? Recommendation? May, may the minister say we have consensus on, on a letter that explains what we talked about tonight. Just a statement of what happened? Yep. Okay, uh, looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Anyone that wants to stay, say no. All those in favor, say yes. Aye. Aye. Aye.